Okay, so we might have a few more people coming in uh, a little bit later, but we were at seven out of 11. I figured that's a quorum. Um, and uh, we're gonna be starting off reading this book, Basic Problems of Phenomenology by Heidegger. Um, the plan is to do this over um, like five sessions, but one of the things we'll ask, I'll ask for at the end is whether or not the pace is right and whether or not we need to slow down, uh, uh, take it slower or anything like that. Um, uh, we go around, uh, I know a bunch of you have been here for uh, other things, but one of the things I'm gonna ask is um, previous experience with Heidegger, uh, that's uh, for other people in the group to understand uh, as well as for me. Um, and that might include, uh, were you here for um, doing being in time with us? Were you here for doing um, Heidegger and Nietzsche with us? Um, uh, just for, um, to help other people get oriented as to uh, what level of, of experience of the subject might be might be expected or not. Um, and then obviously in the first go around, uh, I'm always gonna be asking people, um, did you manage to do the reading? Did you manage to get the book? Um, uh, prior experience, um, interest, how you found us, anything like that. Um, uh, a lot of people are regulars and so you can keep that uh, shorter, but do give your name and so forth for people now. Um, and then uh, we'll do a second round for first impressions to the reading. Um, and then I'll do some stuff about just sort of situating when, when this happened and sort of break down of its pieces. And then we'll start talking about the actual individual things, the, the intro um, sort of discussion of Kant's thesis on its own terms before he moves to his positive criticism of it, his positive criticism of where he comes out. Um, so all, all that's just for a uh, preview of, of what I wanna go through in terms of um, uh, structure of our time. Um, and then, uh, general, you know, more specific questions at the end, if anyone has them, uh, feel free to raise questions along the way, wherever. Um, but we're gonna start with, uh, did you do reading previous familiarity? What you, else you did with us? And we'll start with uh, Chuck. I was afraid you were gonna ask me to start. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm the neophyte in general with regard to any serious study of philosophy. And I'm certainly a total neophyte with regard to Heidegger. Um, I've heard of him. I've heard of being in time because this group had previously discussed him. And I think I may have sat in briefly enough with another earlier session of this group to uh, have heard something about Heidegger in passing. Uh, I have, um, I suppose I could say I have finished the reading in the sense that I read the first quarter or a third with some degree of attention and comprehension. And then the attention and comprehension declined precipitously during the next three quarters <laughs> of what I did go through in terms of the passing of the pages as I tried to understand what was going on. Oh, great, great, great description. Can I, ask, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Did the one quarter, three quarters demarcation mean that the part that was comprehensible was the introduction and as soon as he started talking about Kant it went off the rails or was it the part that he was talking about Kant it was still relatively comprehensible and the part where he's giving his own views it went off the rails? Uh, Kant was still somewhat um, understandable okay, okay? Uh, but uh, as he began moving into more formal um, descriptions of the different ways in which um, phenomenology looks at in a more scientific manner on, at philosophy, I began to get more and more confused. Okay. Um, in, in part because there were several places where it seemed to me there were uh, short statements that seemed to be totally contradictory in one place to another place. And um, I, I'm sure that that made sense within the context of a larger argument um, or a presentation. Um, but it, but, it, but you, you weren't following and it derailed you. I got it. Uh, so the, there, there are there are some places like that. There's certainly things even in the introduction where he's sort of being dialectical and he's sort of taking on the uh, he's he's presenting the argument for a certain point of view that isn't necessarily his own. Uh, and then in the next uh, paragraph or three, he will he will uh, state the opposition to that and it will simply completely contradict what came before. There's sort of that dialectical nature in the uh, in the first in the introduction part. He also does that sometimes with Kant, where when he's trying to explain what Kant says about uh, being in position and existence in absolute position, he will speak of these things in ways where he's, he's, he's trying to bring out a lack of clarity that he sees in Kant's position by repeating Kant's statements in ways which 
may seem incomprehensible or he'll then he'll give an explanation of you know the way in which uh kant speaks about these things the way that which descartes seems about these things have done a complete somersault in terms of what the term object means um so some of the times when he's doing that it's because he's being dialectical or because he's trying to bring out um an unclarity or inconsistency in somebody else's position mm -hmm. you may also find it in some of his own positions and if so definitely call them out right um and if there are places that confuse you um uh definitely call them out, we can try to uh, untangle them. But in my own reading of it, some of those parts do get dense. And this is definitely what I'd call a multi-voice text, right? You gotta pay attention not only to what is being said, but who is said to be saying it. Um, and uh, um, yeah, it's slippery that way, but uh, it's very useful to know uh, where it starts becoming incomprehensible because it will help us focus on you know what needs to be explained. Um, uh, but uh, I normally do first impressions afterwards, but this was part of your, you know, did you do the reading stuff? So that's fine. Um, anything more you want to say on the? I'm going to be trying to take notes on what people say and uh, what references they may make into uh, points in the time in the text. Um, and um, that will at least give me a little bit more uh, focal points to review. Um, before we before I go on myself to the next section of sure. this book that we will consider, um, and uh, I'm perfectly happy to be the neophyte uh, who's trying to figure this all out. Um, but I will also say that being Chinese, um, I knew this in my undergraduate days in college um, at our alma mater that um, by by training and by uh, undoubtedly a certain amount of parental inculcation, I don't speak up, okay? I don't raise a question. I'm not a person who's going to shine in the classroom by asking <laughs> pointed questions and debating with the teacher. Um, I sort of absorb it all in. And then I may have second thoughts later and I may want to see the professor uh, in his office and say, well, what, why did you say this? But I, yes. I, I'll, I won't generally, generally do that in the classroom or in a public context. It's just not my nature, so. Fair so enough, you're, fair you're enough. Free of, you're free of any debate. Well, fine. Uh, 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 questions even by email afterwards are perfectly welcome. Um, and certainly I will do that. questions from last time for the next time, that's also welcome. Yeah. Okay, I, um, um, I should, Briefly include myself because we got enough new people. Uh, I'm I'm Jason Colley. Uh, I I kind of uh, I've been running the group for years now, um, uh, and I'll be sort of doing some expository stuff after we get through people's first reactions to things. Um, lots of familiarity with Heidegger. I've been studying him for a long time. I would say um, since college days, which would be mid 1980s, so maybe uh, 35 years. Um, but Pete is going to go next and give his intro. He's the guy who gives me a run for my money and probably knows more how to do it. Go ahead, Pete. <laughs> uh, hello, I'm Pete. Uh, I live in Redmond, Washington. Uh, I write software for a bank and I'm debating when to retire these days. Uh, so my... Uh, the intro to philosophy was I started reading the existentialists in uh, high school. I read Camus and Sartre, uh, got interested in philosophy and also read introductions to philosophy. And uh, one of the things with the existentialists, uh, especially Sartre, when people asked him, uh, you know, traditional philosophy questions like what is the existentialist position on this and, you know Plato said this and uh, Descartes said that and what's the existentialist position and Sartre would say oh there's this guy Heidegger he, he's figured all that out go, go ask him and so I, uh, I kind of exhausted uh, the French existentialist in my early 20s and so i started trying to read heidegger you know uh bought being in time got nowhere with it uh 
a few, a few years later, I, I got introduction to metaphysics. It's a lecture he gave in 35, uh, which takes a, a different approach to trying to explain what Heidegger's on about and started to get some traction. And I was also interested in other philosophers. And in 95, when the web came along, uh, I'm a, I, I, I learned by doing. So I said, oh, I'll create a website that other people will use. And at that time in 95 for philosophy, there was something called Yahoo. There was a table of contents for the internet. And you go look at philosophy and there were three entries. Uh, two were to Ayn Rand websites and one was to a Rajneesh website. So, oh, the field's kind of totally up, open here, but I don't want to do, I don't want to get too broad. So let me just concentrate. Uh, and I could almost flip the coin between Wittgenstein and Heidegger and decided it was really I had more a uh, couple more books on Heidegger at that point in Wittgenstein and I was part of a Heidegger uh, mailing list on the internet I, I'd been on before the web came along and there were already people sharing a few documents uh, philosophy documents on things called FTP websites uh, and when the web came along, there was also a search engine called Alta Vista. And if you would search for Heidegger, you would find a hundred and something hits. Uh, but most of them were just random, like a phone book from Vienna or, you know, Jack Heidegger, the netware in engineer. But <laughs> five of them were actually papers about Heidegger. So I said, oh, that's what I'll do. I'll set up a web page and say, here's the five papers on the internet about Heidegger. And so if you're searching, you can just go to Yahoo, look at philosophy, and then there's Heidegger. And you go to my page and it has the five links. Uh, and then people started emailing me, oh, here's my paper. And I would add it to the website. And then publishers started sending me books. Things were different back in the 90s in terms of economics of how publishing worked. And I'm, you know, a bit of a polymath. I read anything. So I would read all the books and, you know, add them to the website. Uh, and so I ended up with several bookshelves of Heidegger books and I still have the website. And uh, early this century, there's a group called the Heidegger Circle of people who translate Heidegger into English and uh, come up with different interpretations. And they invited me to join. And uh, I, I've been to, I don't know, five or seven of their conferences and to some seminars uh, on Heidegger. And uh, last year, I discovered the Nietzsche three and four meetup group in Phoenix. And uh, I, I had actually discovered it shortly before COVID, uh, noted it. And then with COVID, it went online. So I said, oh, now I can join. The, uh, yeah. I'm in the same time zone. And so that, that was great. We did the... I. I we were, you know, it was like, I, I joined like the third session or so and uh, le learned a lot about uh, those two volumes in the Heidegger corpus. And now looking forward to uh, learning more about uh, GA23, I think it is, uh, the basic problems of phenomenology. Wonderful. So I, I take it you did the reading. <laughs> yeah, I, I read chapter one. And so the whole Kant thing, it, it's uh, not my favorite part of uh, Heidegger in interpreting a lot of the philosophers who were really popular where he was. And he was, of course, in the middle of the neo-Kantian phase of German philosophy. So he had to respond to Kant. Uh, and it's something coming out of being in time 
and in his you know whole project of the whole expanded six volume being in time that he was going to go through and explain uh, his interpretation of the early Christians and Aquinas and Descartes and Kant. And this is the place where, you know, he, he explains Kant. I, I don't think it's crucial to understanding uh, Heidegger uh, crudely. I think you can go from Aristotle to Heidegger and then the rest of explaining other people in between uh, is, of course, interesting and part of Heidegger's uh, project, uh, Contra Metaphysics, which is probably something we'll get into. Uh, but yeah, not, not my favorite text. I, I can read it and I sort of understand what he's saying in any particular paragraph. <laughs> Uh, but I'm not that uh, familiar with Augustine and uh, Kant. So after reading it, I could not answer an exam question on what did you just read? <laughs> I didn't memorize it, but it kind of made sense as I was going along, reading along. Fair enough. Uh, we will talk a little bit about where this is sort of situated in, in, in Heidegger's work and, and the outline of what it's supposed to cover that you get in the introduction and the what they actually got to, which was much less than the outline. This is a common thing in Heidegger. He gives this, you know, the, the big projection of the four part thing and he does part one and a little part of part two and then he stops because he's got gone on something else. Um, but anyway, that, that certainly happens here too. We'll, we'll talk about all that when we get to the content of the text. Um, Joe, um, did you do the reading past familiarity? Uh, yes, I, I finished the chapter, uh, the assignment all, all the way up yeah. to starting with uh, part chapter two, I guess it is. Uh, and I was very interested in it. I do. I did find it to be very uh, dense reading. I had. With, I was with you with being in time, and I was totally fascinated by the the scope of the subject matter and what we did cover. And uh, the metaphor of trying to drink from a fire hose. I, I got a few drops out of that whole thing, and I I really enjoyed that year very much with being in time. And I'm very pleased. I, I'm surprised in one pe reference passage in uh, today's reading, he mentioned that uh, this book was actually he, his prior book, Being in Time. So this book was yes. subsequent, I guess. Yes, just and after, that, like yeah. one year after. Yeah. Yeah, that helped to clarify because I was wondering is it, was this leading up to doing Being in Time? Because it's piece of doing preliminary stuff. However, well, that having been clear, it's not my concern. Uh, I did find it to be very tough going. and. Uh, I read the first, let's say I went up through page 41 uh, in about a day and a half uh, last week. And so I stuck, now focused, compressed reading the last 50, 40 pages, 30 pages uh, today. And I found myself literally reading almost every sentence twice and reading it the way I did when I was in second grade. I, I would mouth each word, not out loud, but in my mind, one word at a time. Because first off, he uses the words that are similar, so you can't read them rapidly, extant, existence, and he makes an interesting distinction between those two. And so he, he's going through and making all these distinctions, contrasting with Kant, contrasting with what Kant had, making occasional back references to uh, Thomas and, and even Suarez, I noticed at one point. Yeah. And so I began to figure out, okay, what he's doing here to position himself. But I like very much uh, clarifications. For example, I always sort of figured that Dasein was somehow the element where uh, the human being is looking out at the objective universe, more or less, that we picked up in being in time, just as an image in my mind. And intuition, I guess, is the Husserlian, because uh, I didn't actually have the concept straight. Mm -hmm. And here, to get that clear, clarified between extant uh, for objects, like the table, and existence for the Dasein, who's somehow in the same status as the table, but is conscious of the table and is oriented toward the table. And now we now have further uh, discussion of intentionality, which I was del delighted to have that discussion because I've been worried about intentionality since, uh, you know, since my third year in college, when in fact, uh, unbeknownst to both he and I, uh, my best friend and roommate in college the first year he was there, 
uh, has gone on to become uh, quite a, uh, a leader in a very narrow field of uh, philosophy of cognitive science. And uh, I cannot even read his first book because it's, <laughs> it's over my head so much. And I almost had a feeling that Heidegger is gonna help me understand what Mark was looking at way back then. Because he was, he was talking about, he was reading Husserl back then. And I thought to myself, Husserl? Uh, why wouldn't anybody read Husserl? In phenomenology, sort of like solipsism is sort of silly. And anyway, obviously I was totally ignorant and I'm having a lot of fun now. So thank you very much Great. for leading yeah. us through and uh, let us continue. Yep, so there's plenty of things we'll bring up there in terms of like situating uh, when this happened and uh, what it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't cover, the different contrasts he's makes along the way, the um, uh, extant existent thing and uh, 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 tables don't exist because they don't orient towards other tables, something like that. Um, <laughs> no, no, they, they don't have intentionality uh, <laughs> toward other tables. They just they do. They, they have no intentionality with they're, which they can orient on other they're tables. They're expand, right? uh, but only the sign exists in that sense. And the wonderful thing is, you're then ask, uh, asking yourself questions like, is a tomahawk missile existent? But uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, get to that later. Uh, Craig. Okay. Um, first off, I confess I made the mistake of reading the translator's introduction. Ah, <laughs> what uh, uh, I suggest saving that until after you finish the book, because yes. he assumes you've read the book to, to explain what it is it's translating, and it, it was terrible. So, so that that left me a little bit apprehensive. But once I got into the text itself, uh, I really enjoyed it. I love the way he would play with the question. He would ask the question. He would ask it a little bit differently. And he'd get you really sorting on it, and then he'd throw a wrench in it. And uh, so the structure was good. Uh, I I found it probably some of the most enjoyable reading I've done in a while. And uh, but uh, my familiarity with Heidegger in uh, shall we say later times of my life now is minimal. I miss the being in time and miss the Nietzsche, but I spent time with it clear back in the in the ancient uh, time of college and such. And uh, and I'm getting a new appreciation for what he's trying to do. I found it fascinating that he only mentioned Usserl once in the whole section, and he actually mentions Nikolai Hartman once. So yeah. I thought that was an interesting, interesting shift there, although he's rather dismissive of Hartman in what he says. The, um, the, not to get too much into the second part, but the basic problem I had with uh, too much of what he was saying is the orientation towards visual perception without dealing with other aspects of perception. Uh, um, you know, table is something we see. Uh, some chins occasionally uh, tell us exist too when we run into it. But uh, is a breeze or a wind uh, which, we, which we sense in a different sense, is that an object? Is a breeze an object? Uh, it's perceived, it's uh, recognized and perceived. Uh, and we interact with it, but uh, but I was struggle, struggling with uh, with the fact that he was seemed to be too much visually oriented, and I started wondering if maybe phenomenology in general is too vision oriented towards what we see as images and formed around uh, visual imagery, which is a problem I think in our culture where we've uh, turned everything into images and given up on hearing. Uh, I was thinking too because uh, I'm listening to. Uh, to music as this is going on, uh, to what extent is music a, an object? Uh, it's something we perceive, it's something we interact with, it's something we, 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 we come into contact with. So those will be some of the questions that'll be popping up as we go through it, is, uh, is the overly visually orientation of, of his way of addressing phenomenology. Uh, like I say, his, uh, his dealing with Kant, I, I liked, he uh, raised a lot of good questions. I also feel he was probably a little too dismissive of the uh, scientific work and, the, and, and such in terms of trying to bring some understanding to these questions, uh, especially like childhood development. At what point do we, even in development, uh, recognize objects? That's not something we recognize. When we're uh, so to what extent does that go on? And of course, being a scientist, the questions of certain things that we recognize more instrumentally through the extension of the senses, the extension of perception through instrumentation, which does have an impact to philosophy, which he said tends to, from what I can see, dismiss. 
He, he does mention that there's a place where he's uh, a particular concept from Kant about the extension of the senses, uh, and he, he doesn't disagree with the uh, way Kant looks at it there. But uh, on the on the visual perception, I think it's only an impression from this text. I think that uh, there's lots of things in Heidegger that, um, uh, first of all, perception uh, with other senses, but also just um, understanding through language and nuances of language are definitely a clear thing in later Heidegger. There is a definite contrast here with Kant, though. Kant is very much a um, go to this way, he thinks of human understanding as being propositional rather than um, uh, even when he speaks about intuition um, uh, and thinks about things like uh, visual intuition and so forth, um, he's still thinking about it propositionally. Um, Kant is, you know, he, uh, Kant's categories are categories of logical propositions, right? Uh, the way in which you can predicate, right? And, and the, the underlying assumption there is something like that the Transcendental ego is a uh, a proposition oriented machine, um, uh, something like that. Um, some of that we'll come, get to in part four, where we get to um, the logical understanding of things. But if there's a contrast with Kant here, I wouldn't say that it's both visual or that um, he's visual and not enough the other senses. It's more like um, he's going to um, perception as something which has something like uh, phenomenological intuition involved in it through whatever senses. And even before senses, um, which is the real thing going on here, it's before the senses, um, versus Kant's um, basically uh, trying to understand all these things in terms of um, uh, logic, propositions, linguistic construction, um, and linguistic construction not understood not understood as like nuance, subtle nuances of language and meaning and tone or something like that, but you know uh, the propositional content of statements. That's what you really get emphasized heavily in Kant. But um, uh, in terms of the science stuff, uh, he absolutely is uh, um, dismissive of what the sciences can teach philosophy in, these, in this regard. He thinks that the order of those things is the other way around. This was part and parcel of Husserl's big fight with um, psychologism and logic. Um, and you know, he makes a, a comment at some point about uh, um, uh, trying to get psychology to ground uh, 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 philosophical anthropology is like trying to uh, uh, understand geometry by uh, measuring things in physics and chemistry. Um, uh, he thinks it's, it's the, uh, has the logical dependence of the structures of thought the wrong way around. And this is something which he's just adopting from Husserl. Husserl's um, uh, uh, campaign against psychologism and logic is precisely that logic is not about how um, the human mind empirically thinks, but is about how um, uh, the human mind when logically rigorous uh, should think if it wants to maintain the truth of propositions, something like that. Um, so this, and this was a, a giant fight that people like Frege were also involved in uh, at the time. Um, but uh, Husserl was coming out of that, uh, that school of sort of campaign against logical psychologism and trying to give a sort of uh, philosophical phenomenology that would capture a lot of the truths that were coming out of things like um, cognitive psych or later cognitive psych. But uh, while keeping the kind of philosophical basis that left logic its proper place, something like that. Um, but Heidegger is not simply Husserlian in that regard, but there is this, this tendency of um, in the whole school from uh, uh, the logicians to Husserl to Heidegger to say methodologically, the philosophical stuff we're considering is prior to the sciences thinking about these things. And if you invert that order, you're just going to get confused. Um, uh, you're going to try to prove uh, geometric propositions from physics. You're going to try to prove logical propositions from psycho from empirical psychology, and um, you it, it, you can't do that. It won't work. It's the wrong way around. Um, if you if if you if in your psychology psychological reasoning your logic isn't sound, no amount of empirical deductions about logic will save you. <laughs> Something like that. Um, but uh, it is important to know that. Um, that is definitely a tendency that he has. It's coming from his old school. It's coming from the fights at the time uh, about um, uh, foundations of uh, scientific method in neo-Kantianism in general. Um, Pete mentioned the fact that some of this neo-Kantian stuff is, you know, the dominant thing in a lot of philosophy at his time, especially people at places like Mar uh, uh, Marburg um, in his day. Um, uh, the addition of Kant he's always citing is that, is that of um, uh, who was it? Um, Cassier, yeah, Cassier, right. Uh, 
And then um, uh, there's also the whole, um, uh, basically the neo-Kantian uh, position at the time was trying to understand uh, Kant epistemologically, epistemology from Kant as foundations of science as sort of the, um, uh, the basis of a scientific worldview, something like that. Um, and uh, uh, so when he is taking on Kant here, he's not just taking on Kant, he's, he's trying to relate the relatively new concerns of phenomenology to what was the dominant philosophical school at the time. He's trying to show people why we go in this phenomenological direction out of concerns that they, uh, people around him already understood. Um, now, as Pete says, if we don't have that um, uh, awareness in Kant, or we're not in that in that school, right? That can seem like out of left field, you know. Um, uh, but for some people who are trained in those traditions, or in some of the um, analytic philosophy and logical traditions that are relatively close to that, it can be a useful starting point to see where this all um, branches off. The same is true of Husserl, right? People who know, you know, Frege on logic can find Husserl a useful place to branch off from that. Um, uh, put it this way, uh, Anglo-Saxon and more science-oriented philosophy towards continental philosophy, right? Um, that phenomenological turn. Um, he does mention a few other people along the way in that. Um, he mentions uh, uh, Dilthey as having influenced all of the psychology of the day. Um, and the fact that it's uh, trying to become philosophical, psychology is trying to be a, a full science of life and, uh, and a philosophical anthropology as its basis. And his point is that that's not because the empirical psychologist came up with empirical scientific results that convinced him that was the direction to go. It was because a philosophical tradition, which is a precursor of phenomenology, influenced psychology in that direction, right? So psychology reoriented itself based upon philosophical arguments from outside and prior to uh, psychology to change what it thought it needed to concern itself with to something like um, uh, the whole human life world as you know one of the phenomena of life and not uh, in terms of just um, uh, subjective experiences, um, propositional uh, uh, nature of the mind or something like that, that a lot of um, earlier 19th century, sorry, late 19th century, but earlier than this stuff, um, empirical psychology uh, tended to do. Uh, so some of those claims there are you know now of mostly historical interest in the history of science uh, sort of uh, sort of vein. Um, you can detect some of those maybe biases of uh, um, him at the time, but mostly at the time they're kind of, um, if I can put it this way, they're throat clearing and distinguishing the philosophical problematic from the, the, that of other intellectual debates around him. Just sort of say, no, we're not going to talk about that other thing you worry about. You know, it, it's not germane here, right? Stay on topic. Um, uh, is what a lot of those wind up being. Um, but I've I've gone on too long about uh, uh, that question. Um, we should get on to do you the reading. Maybe it's some of it's already fading into first impressions, which is okay if that's where, where people want to go. Um, but Jeff, you look cozy, by the way. Oh, I'm, I'm tired today. <laughs> I was up late. I did not get that much of the reading done, unfortunately. Um, I started at the beginning and the first two sections went along fine. And then I got the end of the first section, I'm like, well, that's just completely wrong. <laughs> so I'm not now, um, oh, I was going to, like, my, my zero impression of Heidegger was actually I, when I was running my own group, uh, right at the beginning of when it started to get interesting. I, 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 just, I just made up topics, right? We weren't doing philosophers. And I remember it was the chicken and egg problem. And then, and then later on, I looked at it and like, oh, this is Heidegger. So I wouldn't say they reinvented it, but I mean, there was enough Heidegger in the air, right? And that, 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 that basically, uh, I thought I had that. So that, that was kind of a high point. Uh, there was another high point uh, a few years later when in the, in the analytic group, we, uh, under, due to the influx of certain people that, that the, uh, the leader wanted to impress, I think. Uh, we, we we went off in some different directions, and we 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 did Heidegger. At first, I think we tried reading, or we we, we were doing phenomenology. I know that we were reading like uh, SCP articles and stuff like that. Uh, and then said, so, "Well, we want to read the original stuff." And so so 
they found this text, the basic problems of phenomenology, and we started reading it. And I was impressed at the leader, how, how we stuck with it. I mean, we really were, we were like, what is being with the capital B versus beings? You know, we spent a long time on that. Uh, we, we ended up to say, like, well, when, we're, when we're talking about it, we'll say beingness, and that way we don't have to say being with a capital B. <laughs> uh, that, 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 that sort of gave us a, a leg up on it. But afterward, he said, it was like, oh, God, I hate Eiger. <laughs> but, but at least we had a good discussion about it. And I felt like it was very, it was difficult. But, you know, that this this text is was written as as a primer as 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 a, as a teaching as, as a textbook, as, a, as I understood it. And uh, everything I read about from Heidegger since then, it's been like, complete like opaque. I, I, it's just like it's just like it's either going in circles and saying nothing, or 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 whatever. So I don't know. So there's there's a lot of room for improvement because then all, all the other Heidegger groups I've gone to have been basically BS sessions, as far as I can tell. So with the exception of when 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 Jason discussed it here, I, I, I think we were doing Heidegger at that time, or maybe it was something else. But I really liked his explanation of these sort of things, so I figured I would give it a go. Uh, I did skip ahead to the Kant chapter because that's been my thing in the last year or so. Uh, you know, following up on on, on the Arendt mostly, so I wouldn't call myself a Kantian. But uh, that uh, I, I, I was interested to see what he had to say about that. But I just I didn't get very far because I didn't remember this meeting until yesterday, so I started pretty late. Understood. Okay. Uh, Sam, did you manage to do the reading uh, previous experience with either this text or H other Heidegger? Oh, very little experience. Uh, but uh, honestly, uh, I'm just here to maybe listen along and see if I might be inspired to delve a little bit deeper into Heidegger. And as I mentioned, our local group will in Austin will be starting uh, being in time. So in, I'm in just January, here. you said, right? Right. right. Yep. Uh, are they going to do that in person or are they going to be doing that online? Pardon? Are they going to be doing that in person meetings or online meetings? My understanding is right now hybrid uh, is the plan, meaning they'll be meeting. But uh, if the tech problems can be worked out, then yeah, there should be an online component too. Okay, I mean, uh, certainly if you uh, um, get close to the time and any of those things are set up, uh, feel free to like cross post them under our meetings so that if people here are interested in. Uh, seeing those other meetings in the other group on being in time, they can uh, know about it. Um, uh, yeah. for, for, for me, it's it's all I can do to, to follow one of these things at once. But if, if people uh, uh, want, want to go look at that one, you know, uh, uh, they're welcome. Sure. And yeah, I mean, you can just check out, you know, the meetup page for Austin Philosophy Discussion Group. So yep. just okay. be to I think. But uh, yeah, like I said, you know, I'm just here to listen and maybe I'll find something useful. Thanks. Okay, uh, uh, Dan, welcome. And uh, background, did you manage to do the reading? Uh, have you read either this or other Heidegger before? Anything like that? Yeah, um, so hi, I'm Dan. Uh, so let me say first that I, I don't have any background in philosophy. So I'm a scientist, I'm a, I'm a statistician. And uh, I was interested kind of in philosophy and especially philosophy of science, existentialism, literature, history. And uh, like 10 years ago, I spent an entire summer and I read half of the being in time after I tried several times. And then for some reason I gave up, I stopped there. And then two years ago I returned. And since then I, I read being in time twice since then. And for the last two years, I'm just cruising through Heidegger, like going, two, three hours every day and probably read, I don't know, 30, 40 books. And I read this book about three, four months ago. And uh, I guess what I'm, I'm having now a blast is the, you know, the period with the contribution to philosophy. I read that and I loved it. And then mindfulness and then his ponderings. And I'm kind of, to, I don't know, put everything together. And, but it's, it's, it's a private enterprise for me, just doing it by myself and joining groups like this to, to, I don't know, make sure I'm the right, on the right track. I'm not going crazy here or <laughs> yes, talking it's, to it's, myself. It, uh, an enormous amount of learning Heidegger happens uh, in private by in individuals wrestling with it, uh, just because of the difficulty of it, I would say. Um, 
and there's no question that it is useful to come up for air and you know share with others occasionally to see if you're on the right track, et cetera. Um, uh, so I, I admire the submersion effort and intensity of it. Uh, uh, definitely been there, um, but uh, uh, it is useful to bounce uh, impressions off others uh, as well as just increasing the dosage. Both of those work. <laughs> um, I agree. But, uh, but, uh, as a, as a slight warning, I mean, we, we are going to try to stick to just this one. Um, I know there's like a million, you know, uh, uh, rockets of connection going off to uh, other things, uh, especially because there's a lot of people who want to know, know those other things. We're going to try to keep it to uh, uh, the content of this one just to help people uh, intro to it. Um, I would say that um, in my own experience, um, the book Pete uh, recommended uh, or mentioned, um, Introduction to Metaphysics, and this one, I think are, are two of the easiest entry points for people to understanding uh, uh, all of Heidegger, um, in part because of the degree of connection to other philosophy. So if people don't have any, you know, connection to those other traditional forms of philosophy, those might not be the best entry points, might be better to just start with being in time. Um, but if you do have uh, awareness of, you know, uh, Kant and scholasticism and Descartes, right, then this is a very useful entry point. If you've got uh, a fair grounding in ancient philosophy and modern philosophy uh, uh, and general metaphysical themes than intro to metaphysics is a, is a useful entry point. It just helps people with um, background in other philosophies latch onto uh, uh, points of difference, points of development, you know, learn what Heidegger uh, has to say about the, the history. Um, uh, anyway, uh, all of those things are, well, either, either of those things to me is a useful introduction to then reading Being in Time. Um, and from that, as a basis, there's lots of other stuff that comes afterwards, which is quite different, but um, you sort of need to know all those pieces um, to know what the other different things are different from. <laughs> um, uh, in, terms of, in terms of this one, um, people have several times mentioned Kant or the Kant chapter. There's um, multiple places where, we'll, where you know Kant comes up. The, the main one is in our, uh, our chapter one, uh, Kant's thesis being is not a real predicate. Um, he'll come back again in um, uh, uh, in chapter, well, parts of chapter three and in chapter four. Um, uh, but so there's a lot of Kant throughout the book is what I'm trying to say. Um, and chapter two is mostly on the scholastics, um, but the scholastics have already come up even in chapter one. Um, so um, there are places, the chapters are really thematically organized around questions. Those questions mostly correspond to individual people in the sense that chapter one is mostly focused on uh, Kant, but even understanding what Kant is saying there, you have to understand who Kant is saying it against, which is like his immediate pre uh, predecessors in the, uh, in the school of Leibniz and people after Leibniz and Wolf um, and the relation of all that to his classicism. Um, so that's all there even in, even in the first chapter. In the second chapter, it's mostly about this classics directly, but you know, things back to Aristotle will definitely be involved in that. Um, and, uh, and then in the third chapter, it's mostly about modern philosophy in the sense of um, Descartes, but we'll also include things going forward again to, to Kant. So the, the period of most of it is scholasticism to Kant in terms of what's being talked about, um, but he'll flip back and forth through that. And at the end of it, in the logic stuff, he'll even go a little beyond the contemporary logical positivists. Um, uh, not primarily German idealism, not primarily ancient philosophy other than Aristotle. Uh, Plato comes up in a few places, certainly. Um, but, uh, okay, just orientation of what's the, what's the sort of um, field of play and the other people um, and doctrines um, that are involved. Um, okay, uh, I don't know if, if other people, I think we've already sort of gotten through a round of first impressions, just a little bit about situating this. Um, as you're talking with Joe, this is um, a year after Being in Time is published. Obviously, he was working on Being in Time for a while, so it's a little bit later than that in terms of his um, uh, uh, work. Uh, it was a originally a uh, uh, lecture course, right? Um, the version that we have published here came out much later in the 70s um, using um, his lecture notes so that he was you know, planning to lecture, plus a bunch of um, uh, notes taken by a student in shorthand at the time. Um, and then those two edited together um, in a fairly elaborate process to try to capture anything that was either said in the lecture or written in Heidegger's notes, um, even if it wasn't in the other, um, while you know trimming out stuff that was just uh, intro repetitive at the start of each lecture, he might go over 
what he talked about last time or something, and that might be edited out. Um, but uh, so the point is the text as we have it here is from considerably later in the 1970s, but it is a, rec uh, a recording of uh, a lecture course he gave one year after being in time was published. Um, in between, he taught another course on history of philosophy um, with a semester on um, ancient philosophy and another one on modern philosophy. Uh, he mentions that briefly in, in, in the, uh, I think the intro section here. Um, but uh, uh, so this wasn't the first course he taught right after being time was published, but it was you know within a year um, or a, a year later. Um, and uh, understand that in being in time, right? He laid out this whole project and there was gonna be a whole second part of being in time that you know kind of didn't appear. Um, there are elements of that which are being covered here in some of the Kant reactions and also in a later uh, book on Kant, uh, uh, Kant and the Problem of Metaphysics, um, uh, which some of which is kind of like what he was promising to do in the uh, second part of Being in Time, but not completely. Um, similarly, in this one, in the intro section, he lays out a, col a whole sort of um, outline of the course where he talks about parts one, two, and three. Um, and uh, uh, if you look at the introduction, you'll see that, you know, um, part two, uh, basic structures and basic ways of being, you know, one chapter on that occurs. There's four chapters on the thing he called part one. The rest of, chart of part two isn't there. All of part three isn't there, right? He does kind of speed up at the end of, um, at the, end of the course uh, in some of the part two stuff. He kind of compresses some of the things he was planning to say later in part two to try to fit them in. Um, but he, he never gets through even all of what he was going to be part two and he never gets to part three. Um, so the, the, this, this phenomena of projecting a big thing that he thinks he's gonna get through and not getting through all of it is certainly something that happens to Heidegger as a, as a teacher and a lecturer. Um, and, and this one was supposed to have only one third of its time on this sort of preliminary review of history of philosophy down to uh, his day and reaction to it, the critical part, so to speak. Um, and uh, instead it was four fifths of the course because they, you know, by the time they get to the end of it, that's all the time they had. He did get to some of his stuff um, uh, and the, the temporality dimension in particular. And some of the stuff there is uh, similar to some of the material in the second half of being in time, uh, that is the published being in time, not the planned second half of being in time, um, uh, but different in some ways. Um, so uh, we also see in the structure of this chapter itself that he will often be treating the traditional problem and then he'll give you some um, more of his own views in the second half of each. So instead of it being all the critical stuff and then a whole second section on his own stuff. And then some uh, third thing on, you know, the method that can be derived from the whole thing, which he never gets, he never gets to. He instead gives you like some of his reactions and some positive statements in the, in the later part of each of the first four chapters. That certainly happens here where he switches halfway or so through um, the, the, the Kant chapter from um, considering Kant's thesis and, and criticizing it and saying what, you know, maybe less than clear in it over to the big discussion of intentionality and um, his sort of, uh, his or phenomenology is positive take on the same uh, problem of is being perception um, uh, in, in the second half of that chapter. So the point that I'm making is that some of that is a substitute for treating all of his positive part two stuff uh, at the end of the course. Um, if you're expecting there to be a giant, you know, as big as the, this whole thing, end of the course part of his positive stuff, it isn't there, right? Only uh, one, one, one fifth of it is there. And, but in a way, if you've gotten through this and you've read that one fifth, that's okay. You're ready. If you want the other part, you can go read Being in Time. You'll get a version of it from a year ago instead of a year later. But <laughs> um, uh, that's one of the reasons why people call this a good intro to it is because it will take you from any understanding of previous philosophy, drop you squarely into the problem of being in time uh, in, 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 in section five of this. And if from that you've got, you should have enough to be sort of oriented if you go then read being in time um, as a result. Okay, um, that's just an outline of sort of the basic things about when this happened, uh, how we have it. Um, uh, I wanna mention just one other terminological thing um, that, that the translators talk about it, he talks about it, but um, in the beginning of, uh, of the chapter two and specifically, um, uh, Heidegger has his own technical language for things like um, existence and extantness, right? But Kant also is a technical philosopher, his own technical language of things, and he winds up using existence in a different sense. 
the term which is being translated here as existence in German is Dasein, and sometimes given the Latin form existence with a Z at the end. Um, and Kant uses those basically synonymously to mean something like um, um, external existent, which uh, for Heidegger is, uh, the translator gives extant, which is really usually um, being at hand or for hand in, 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 the, in the original German. Um, but understand that uh, the term existence in specifically, you have to always ask not what does, what, what does this word mean, but what does this word mean relative to so-and-so's vocabulary? Right, Kant's vocabulary for existence, or Aquinas's vocabulary for existence, or Heidegger's vocabulary for existence aren't going to mean the same thing by the term. Okay, um, let's just say, warning: here be a landmine. Right, he he calls it out himself. Um, uh, several people have already noticed it, but um, uh, some people mentioned something that seemed to contradict itself. You know, in a few pages, um, if a change in voice has happened and you're no longer talking about how Kant sees something, and you're not talking about how Heidegger sees something, expecting the same word to still be in the same place. Um, uh, will lead you astray, right? Each of these systems of technical language um, is sort of complete in itself, um, but you have to understand it in its own terms. Now, that said, there are borrowings across all these. And one of the things that Heidegger points out in the, both in the intro and the uh, first part of this is that many of these, um, uh, I'll go to this way, uh, doctrinal understandings of the meanings of these terms or these distinctions that you find in a, uh, in a Kant go back to things in scholastic philosophy. Um, they go back to the time of uh, Aquinas and Scotus and Suarez. And in many, many cases, the, the line of influence is, you know, uh, Aquinas and uh, Don, Don Scotus fought about something and Suarez came along a few hundred years later and tried to um, arbitrate the dispute and come up with his own doctrine on it. And Descartes read that and um, and then uh, Leibniz uh, and, and Spinoza agreed with Descartes on that but, and without recognizing they were uh, uh, agreeing with Suarez necessarily, although Leibniz usually does recognize that. And then people like Christian Wolff agree with Leibniz. And so you get all the, all the things down to just before Kant, what he's reacting to is a unified tissue from Christian Wolff to Suarez um, using the same terms in the same way, even though the other philosophical doctrines might be moving. Okay, anyway, it's just, the point that I'm making is sometimes you have to be able to read longitudinally and see the continuity of ideas. And other times you have to be able to say, oh, when he says existence, he means something entirely different because I switched from this philosopher to that philosopher. And keeping track of all of those can be hard. No question, it's just challenging. It's not because there isn't a uh, ticketing and sorting of each of those things, which understands them each correctly in its context. There is. If you're not understanding it, it's not because it's not understandable. Um, but it is hard to understand. Uh, there's just a lot of players on the field and a lot of counters on the field to keep track of. Okay, that's just a sort of methodological warning about what to be careful of in terminology. Um, the other uh, other word we get that's um, barely translated here, I say barely translated, it is translated, uh, is Kant's technical term position. Um, and uh, the position here, the, the, the translator will, will consistently say, position, absolute position, um, positing. Uh, that's um, uh, sets or gesetz in, in German, um, which is closer to the, um, uh, I put it this way, it's set in the sense of set down, um, something like that. Um, uh, and uh, Kant presents this as an idea, which is barely telling you more than the notion of being itself, which you're supposed to be able to un understand intuitively. But he thinks that to say that uh, being is uh, is position and um, existence is absolute position. Um, this is related to uh, notions of positivism. It is also uh, related to, uh, yeah, something like that. But the word itself is just something like set to set down, um, and that's a. a Sometimes when a translator doesn't have the same conceptual structure in the language he's translating into as the one he's translating from, he just uses a different language. Position is just Latin, right? And so he, he doesn't have equivalent set of uh, words in, in, in English for it. There's this constellation of words over here in German. He can't trace it in, in English. So he just uses a Latin word. It's also an English word. That's what's going on with position. Um, anyway, I just thought that that would be 
as if, as if everybody's terminology changing isn't enough. These are also all be translating between languages. And sometimes the translator to translate from one language to another doesn't use the language he's translating into you. He, he uses the Latin that you don't know, right? <laughs> um, so uh, just acknowledging some of the things that can make it uh, difficult. Um, I don't think, by the way, that any of that means that this is incomprehensible. It's comprehensible. Um, so if you if you if you haven't haven't gotten it, you should be asking the questions and reading it carefully and ask even more of the questions. But don't think that there isn't a sense there um, if it's not immediately obvious to you. The other thing that's definitely a a problem here is that he's not only considering multiple philosophies, he's also um, uh, claiming that some of them are wrong or, mis or misleading. Um, so there's sexually, especially the second half of that first chapter, he'll be telling you that some things there, he'll, he'll say, there's a way of understanding this, which um, views intentionality um, too objectively and is wrong because it's too objective. And there's a way of understanding intentionality, which is wrong because it is subject, a subjectivizing of intentionality and the right understanding does neither of those things. Um, if you, normally think of all those things in terms of subject object distinctions and that conceptualization. It's not enough to say that it's difficult to translate that from his language to yours. There isn't a translation of it from his language to yours. He's saying you have to blow up your framework, right? And if you're saying that you have to blow up the framework even to see the thing I'm talking about, you cannot treat that as just a translation problem, right? So that's just the other warning I put out here. Um, um, not everything that can be said in one structure can be said in another structure. And if he's criticizing that structure as you know, a misleading way of misunderstanding the problem, um, you cannot deal with that as something where you just have to translate into your terms to try to understand what he's saying in your terms. If you under, don't understand in his terms, you won't understand it. Um, okay, so those are just sort of methodological warnings. Um, I wanna get to the things about the introduction and then uh, uh, chapter one next, but I'm gonna, pause and give people a chance to ask questions about anything I just said or any questions about the situation when this happened or um, uh, how we have it or anything like that before we get into the content of the introduction. Well, uh, thank you for that uh, brief summary. I would like to have uh, uh, ready at hand uh, one of these days for reading purposes, some kind of crosswalk table of all those distinctions uh, but I appreciate that that's probably not something that you have uh, to simply send out to people. But it's a very interesting uh, confusion of trying to track these people using uh, the words uh, that we would almost think are the same, but actually have important uh, nuanced differences in each one. And I'm as an economist, I'm sort of reminded, well, this sounds like a world of floating exchange rates and nobody quite knows exactly what the hell it, how things are moving in, in, in as they move from country to country, language to language. But it's a very interesting problem in uh, communication of ideas. Yeah, uh, fair. Um, I, I have in the past, sometimes we did this in being in time uh, specifically, put together like a glossary, uh, a set of terms with explanations of them. And you can have a glossary that includes an entry for uh, as Kant thinks of it, as uh, Heidegger thinks of it. Um, uh, I definitely could do that for some of the concepts here. It's not a not a terrible idea as something to just uh, write up and circulate. I, I might need it one more time because uh, I, I did come across it uh, sometime in the past several months, but uh, now all my papers are in boxes in a warehouse. No, I, I'm not saying I just used the last one. I'm saying I, I could reproduce that that action yeah. of just you know making a new glossary for concepts here and, and, and circulating it before the next meeting to see if it's help, uh, helpful and let people ask questions yeah. of it. Um, yeah, I uh, get a thumbs up from Jack. So that, that's not a yeah. terrible idea, Craig. I got the same. I got the same sense uh, that the translator was sort of trying to do that with the lexicon that's in the back, but uh, my reading is he failed miserably. Uh, <laughs> he starts off trying to do that, but then he gives you entries in, in, in the lexicon in the back that are like just page references, and then he'll give you others where, you know, uh, in the lexicon mm -hmm. problems, comma specific. In the course of these lectures, the author formulated many specific problems, and he gives you this whole giant, you know, essay that is just sitting inside the note under what the meaning of problems, comma specific, is. And I'm sorry, that's just that didn't belong in a lexicon, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> but okay, um, uh, yes. Uh, so I want to just I want to deal with the the introduction relatively quickly. I think the introduction is, in a way, less interesting than everything in chapter one. Um, 
uh, he, we do have this sort of outline of the course, um, but I, I would characterize a huge portion of the introduction as throat clearing and um, dealing with um, contemporary common perceptions of the nature of philosophy in his day, much of which is not our, and not true any longer in our day. But the, the, the fundamental sort of contrast in the introduction is between uh, worldview philosophy and scientific philosophy, something like that. And then he gives a, uh, um, a version of that distinction. Well, he gives, he, he gives this dialectical thing. At first he gives a version of the scientific philosophy that uh, would mean that it's uh, not at all um, worldview philosophy. And then he gives a version of worldview philosophy that swallows scientific philosophy. And then he gives a version of scientific philosophy that swallows worldview philosophy. And then he gives a version of scientific philosophy that doesn't care about worldview philosophy, right? And you, you get all these you get ring on changes, but what's fundamentally in play there is just to distance the whole thing he's doing from a contemporary in the 20s in Germany version of worldview philosophy. He doesn't want to be doing worldview philosophy, right? Uh, and philosophy of worldview stuff. And partly this is continuity with the program of Husserl. Husserl famously wrote a book on uh, uh, philosophy of rigorous science um, and may not be rigorous science as we would understand the term. In German, you know, science is wisdom or uh, knowledge, knowledge really, um, uh, of Wissenschaft. Um, and uh, um, Husserl's, in Husserl's program for philosophy as rigorous science, his point is that he does not want it to be um, uh, mere commentary on history, and he doesn't want it to be uh, um, subjective, and he doesn't want it to be, you know, value positing. He doesn't want it to be um, uh, subjectively legislative, if I can put it this way, um, in a way that was, um, from his point of view, uh, too common in uh, people uh, coming out of the um, life world philosophy, people reacting to the uh, to Nietzsche and the increased importance of psychology. Um, also just ideological uh, uh, understandings of philosophy. Um, so in all of that, there was this, um, there was a kind of a traditional problematic of the time in, from I see the turn of the century to the twenties in Germany of is X, you know, rigorous science or is X just opinion, something like that. And you get that in also in, in Weber, we'll talk about science as vocation and we'll distinguish between the value-free social science that's actually science and the, you know, uh, the, the mere values which are just posited by worldviews which are in conflict with each other. Some of this was the contemporary way of trying to factor political fighting out of um, academic work, right? Um, you didn't want to have your academic work be in a party. And the way to do that was to restrict what it was doing to either something which didn't worry about values at all or try to do with things which are technical enough or, but it was all an attempt to get above the fray of the mere party political um, fights uh, that were already you know, quite intense in the era. And, and that's really what's going on in the throat, throat, throat clearing stuff. He's trying to move this philosophy stuff above the plane of political fighting, if I can put it that way, above the plane of ideology, uh, he, because uh, he, he worries that anything like worldview philosophy uh, risks turning uh, philosophy into you know, just an ideology fighting other ideologies. Um, so uh, anyway, that's to me the primary meaning of all the throat clearing in the first chapter. We can go into what he means by worldview philosophy and what he means by scientific philosophy if, we, if you want, but I, I honestly don't think it's that important because we're not in that contemporary situation. The, the, um, the parts that are of interest there is there's views there on um, history and whether or, not, um, uh, whether or not philosophical views are always uh, uh, within a particular worldview or something like that. Uh, which do come out uh, later. But um, honestly, most of this is not Heidegger's own philosophy. It's just reacting to the ambient philosophy, or common understanding of philosophy in his day. And in all of that, what he does in, in that intro is basically said, uh, say something like, um, Kant is trying to do philosophy in, the, in, a, in a sense of just understanding what is, and that's what I would like to be trying to emulate myself, right? Um, so, uh, the very end of the book will, you know, uh, again, go back to this Kantian notion and try to distinguish philosophy done for the sake of arriving at truth uh, from something like philosophy that has become enthusiastic and is, you know, uh, just dumping for an outcome or something. Um, there are methodological versions of that in the beginning that may seem a little bit weird, you know, um, uh, uh, that, that uh, science as, uh, as ontology cannot take a standpoint. Um, 
what is he trying to say about that? It doesn't posit a being. There's a, there's a sense in which um, Kant's critical philosophy was trying to be things that were trying to understand the conditions of the possibility of experience. It was trying to be, <coughs> pardon me, a priori um, prior to the empirical. So it wasn't trying to make empirical claims about what is that it left for the positive sciences to talk about. And because of that, um, in uh, Kantian philosophy was trying to be as philosophy prior to or above even the fray of the sciences, let alone the fray of politics. So there's an element of that here too. Um, some of the things in the intro um, um, do bring up you know, the distinction between ontic sciences and ontological investigation and ontological investigation in his sense, which is not quite the same as the uh, sense of you know, the Christian wolves of the world or the Kant's world. So some of that may be um, technically useful to understand. If you have questions about it, I can, I can go into it. But um, uh, the, the other thing to say is he, he says he wants to go through all of this to um, uh, make his entry points you know, less arbitrary. I don't think he makes them entirely unarbitrary. <laughs> um, the, the, the reality is he's picked these questions um, because they are um, about the science of being. They're about the problem of being. The fact that he is focused on the problem of being is only tangentially related to the desire to be doing, uh, uh, you know, uh, non-worldview philosophy. It's mostly that just that it's his problem, right? His problem is the ontology as the science of being, and and you know, eleven. He just says we now assert that being is the proper and sole theme of philosophy, and this is not our own invention, right? Um, but certainly, the degree of emphasis he puts on the problem of being as the core problem in philosophy, the thing that philosophy needs to make progress on, and the thing which is the keystone of which you can understand the whole history of past philosophy in the West, right? That is definitely Heidegger, right? Heidegger is bringing that to the table. It's not something he got from uh, uh, others before, right? Um, and that orientation is, as he puts it, merely asserted in the intro. It's going to have to be borne out by what he does with it. He hasn't actually you know, given any demonstration that that's the proper task of philosophy. He's just said that it is, and now he's got to go prove it. Um, so there's an element of the, of the intro, which is making these high claims for what scientific philosophy can do or philosophy as rigorous science can do. Um, and that's all promissory note, right? He has, to, he has to prove it. He has to show that his investigation of being can discover something fundamental and new that was you know, missed by previous philosophy um, to, make, to make good on the boasts of the, of the intro, if that makes sense. Um, so, OK. Uh, all of that said, uh, do people have specific questions about the intro before we get into the uh, the part one, which is to me the real part? But were the concerns of the introduction incomprehensible to people? I guess is the first thing. Some people mentioned that you know they could understand for a while until they got in, into chapter one and things started to go off the rails. Um, did you understand what he meant by the inverted world, for example? Yes, no? Uh, I did not understand that in the first place, but I infer or deduce that it had to do something with, uh, when you subject things to a great deal of uh, minute analysis uh, and then try to uh, sort of uh, then re revisit them as a whole again, moving your thought process up and down from smaller and smaller detail and distinctions up to what it is that you started with. I figured that might be something to do with it. Partly. I mean, partly this is the stuff he gets at later when he says that philosophy is um, uh, concerned with the problematic of what seems obvious, right? But but what he's really trying to, what he's really trying to say here, this is kind of an appeal to the something that the neo-Kantians of his day all understood about Kant and Kant's Copernican revolution, right? Most of the sciences, uh, most human thinking deals dogmatically with the world. It tries to understand what's the case. And when, as soon as it has something as a case, it, it marches forward. It tries to pile truth upon truth and deduction upon deduction in the forward direction of learning more about the world, right? The inverted world is to ask how you know anything about that, to ask what uh -huh. must be true about you such that you think that way, right? The, the Kantian formulation of this is what are the conditions of, 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 the, uh, of the possibility of experience, right? What, what prior structuring does the mind throw upon the world in order to uh, uh, understand it in, 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 uh, in categories, right? Things in uh, Aristotle that are about uh, categories, things in Plato that are about ideas, things in uh, 
uh, about logical procedure, things about the possible forms of the judgment of the understanding in Kant, um, anything like that is this philosophy in the sense of inverted, inverted world because it's looking back on the machinery of understanding to understand how the world has to understand to the understanding subject or something like that. And he calls that the inverted world because it's always looking at the things you understand backwards. It's not looking at them to, it's looking at them as evidence of how something like understanding happens, right? And when he talks about inverted world, that's what he means. He means this uh, seeing the thought in things and the thought and the thought about things as opposed to just using thought to see the things. Um, and uh, he appeals to both Kant and Hegel in that regard. Um, uh, and he says, you know, this is, it all, that always seems topsy-turvy to common sense, right? Common sense doesn't know why you would, uh, it looks to common sense like reasoning backwards. Um, uh, and this also relates to the issue of, do you, um, use the results of the positive sciences and make further deductions from them to steam your way forward to understanding things. And uh, the inverted world is where you don't do that. Inverted world is where you, you know, run, that real, run that movie backwards. Um, uh, so um, all of that he uses is just intro to what is the, what he, his basic problem of what does being signify, right? Um, and the question, what does being signify is meant to be one of these inverted world kinds of questions, because the claim is that all the positive sciences treat that as a phenomenon, something so well understood and so trivial that uh, you can base everything else on them and you never have to raise that question, right? Um, but the, in the inverted world, you raise that question and you uh, ring it for all it's worth. You need to, you need to understand everything that, you act, that uh, human thought actually intends or means by something like being. Um, Okay, but that's just, that's a particular example of inverted world thinking. Okay, so. If I can say something, please. I, 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 I think what you, uh, I think what you, you just mentioned, I think a, a, a very good example is what's happening these days with artificial intelligence. They try to pile up facts and over facts, and they think that will, will build a intelligence and they, they cannot go to that problem, what you call the inverted world. They cannot get a grasp on it and they cannot, and because of that, the whole project cannot stand. I think that's to me the, the fundamental point of, of it. And I think Heidegger pointed to that. There is something there. You need to go beyond the, the facts and you see what's how the being and thinking is possible. And there is it's not about facts, it's about something else. And that's the probably what's most difficult with Heidegger to, to, to get to this, to the inverted world. No, that was I, I agree with I agree with you that it's not about facts and that it's some, trying to get at something was there something like structures prior to facts. I'm not so sure that uh, that commits us to the view of AI being impossible. A different story, uh, but uh, I, I just think it's a tangential question. I just wouldn't bring in the AI question as too contentious for it. Uh, uh, but that's just a fact about AI. It's not a fact about the other claims you made. Um, uh, certainly. Um, uh, philosophical thinking as both Kant understood it and as um, Heidegger understands it here is trying to think about uh, something like uh, a priori structures of comprehension that are uh, not simply reducible to you know, a set of positive facts about uh, the world or about the mind, right? Um, so uh, there are plenty of people in, uh, in later, um, philosophical positions will just take this as useful discoveries of uh, in the field of cognitive science and throw out that reorientation entirely, right? They will just use what phenomenology has discovered about uh, that inverted world as um, uh, a set of useful facts for them to understand about cognitive psychology, about human beings, and they will, uh, but they will completely retain a positivist naturalist worldview and completely uh, be uninterested in any other philosophical reorientation of that regard. Of that regard. Um, is that a legitimate uh, uh, use or reading of Heidegger? It's a, it's a mining of him for, for, for uh, uh, useful nuggets or something, but it's a strip mining. It's not his original intention, right? So if after you fully understood Heidegger, that's all you want to do with him, it, it's because you have you know, your other reasons, hopefully sound ones for uh, not being convinced by Heidegger and you're just trying to get what you can for, out of it. Um, but uh, 
first understand him himself, I would say. Um, but I, I don't want to rule, it, rule that out as something that someone might want to do eventually after they fully comprehended Heidegger if they don't find him convincing, um, right? But uh, anyway, the point is we have to have to remember that we, when we, as we consider these philosophers, we get to put them in, 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 uh, in some doubt brackets of our own um, and decide uh, after we've understood them um, uh, how much we want to, um, how far we think it, uh, what we've learned about them goes. But um, uh, don't do that along the way with every proposition or you'll just never understand them because you're, you're, if you bring too much resistance to the table, I'm not saying you'd be doing this today, I'm saying others might, um, if you bring too much resistance to the table, um, uh, you won't be able to see how any of it coheres as, as its own thing. Um, okay. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about for you to the uh, chapter one is the, um, the, the, the four questions, right? Um, this is just sort of um, preview of where we're going and the, and the chapters, the, the, the four theses, Kant's thesis that being is not a real predicate. That's the one we're going to talk about this in the rest of this chapter, uh, rest of this session. But then you get a little bit of a foretaste. Um, it is the thesis of medieval ontology, scholasticism, going back to Aristotle, that the constitution of, the being, of a being, there belongs whatness or essence and existence or extantness. The third is the thesis of modern ontology. The basic ways of being are being of nature and being of the mind. And the fourth the thesis of logic in the broadest sense, every being regardless of its particular way of being can be addressed and talked about means of the is of the, of the, the means of the is, the being of the cupola. Um, and as he says, these look originally look arbitrary. They're not going to be hopefully arbitrary after he gets done. But um, uh, a way to think about this is he, he wants to he wants to examine all these um, both to open up sort of the problems of how much complexity there is in consideration of being or ontology generally, but also to show that there are um, things left out missing or um, um, unclear or insufficiently grounded in the, in, in the phenomenal evidence. Um, so to speak, from each of these. He wants to show an inadequacy of previous understanding of the meaning of being that he is going to make up for, right? Um, by the end, he will also be uh, uh, trying to show that there is uh, a sort of a unified alternative understanding of all of those things so that he can solve all of those uh, problems of all those previous uh, um, uh, areas of confusion or areas of um, uh, less than clarity, right? So the point is, the overall claim here is, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to show you four previous attempts that each have a problem, right? They each have something unresolved in them, um, but e each is pointing to something. And then I'm going to, along the way, I may give you criticism of each, I may give you some elements of the solution to each, but I'm going to put together the solutions to all of them by the end in a way that is gonna make more coherent sense than the individual answers to each one. So as we're reading along, we have to keep track of that claim. We have to see if he substantiates that claim, right? Because the overarching claim being made in this book is that previous understandings of, the, of, of, of being were inadequate in various ways because they all misunderstood it in too shallow a way with regard to only one distinction and not from the proper horizon and so on, whatever, right? Um, and he, uh, the claim to have gotten farther, uh, deeper, a more correct understanding of these things. To substantiate that claim, he has to show not only what's wrong with each of them, but how he can explain what they were thinking about and confused about better than they understood it themselves from his own standpoint, right? So you want to track whether or not he succeeded in doing that in each of the chapters. And then you want to also track whether or not he succeeds in doing that in putting them all together um, in section five. Okay, so as we read section one, you know, as I said, there's some promissory notes in the first chapter. There's there's a general claim that um, um, the, pro the proper uh, task of philosophy is to understand what being means. And uh, everybody before claims it's trivial in one way or another or simple in one way or another. He claims it's not, that it's a, a major problem and that uh, understanding that major problem correctly can get right a whole bunch of things that previous philosophy got wrong. And now he has to substantiate that claim. He has to go off and you know, show you, you know, prove it to your eyes. Um, uh, okay. So when we go into the Kantian thesis, right? That's our, 
that's sort of the, the task he set himself. And this is characteristic of Heidegger. He will make a big, broad, ambitious claim and then he'll go try to prove it, right? He, he doesn't, he doesn't uh, operate by uh, a careful deduction that uh, is going to have you agree with him every step of the way. He's going to knock you over with a claim so big you cannot believe that it is true and then he's gonna go try to prove it to you. And that's meant as a, both as a piece of rhetoric and as a method of argumentation to have a certain impressiveness about it, right? Um, uh, he's not trying to do a little thing. He's trying to do a big thing and uh, um, he wants big results. Okay. Um, okay. So that's just background to the Kantian thesis. And the Kantian thesis is introduced in the problem in, in, in the context of what? The ontological proof, the existence of God, right? So we're supposed to be talking about the problem of being and instantly we get problems about uh, um, uh, uh, traditional proofs about uh, uh, the existence of God and uh, what problems they may have. And the, uh, um, I think accurately, uh, Heidegger presents this as, first of all, he, the, he explains the ontological, ontological argument, which is uh, the Anselm's argument, as it's usually called. Um, and then Kant is going to uh, attack that argument in two places, once in an earlier work, and then later in, in the Critique of Pure Reason with the full machinery available to him to approach these things. Um, and uh, he is going to claim that the, the, um, the ontological proofs is impossible for a specific reason. Um, and Heidegger points out, he's not the first person to say that the ontological proof doesn't work. The first person to say the ontological proof didn't work that we know of, at least in print, was Aquinas, but he had a different reason for thinking the ontological proof didn't work. For those who don't know, um, Aquinas didn't like the ontological proof. He liked the first cause proof better. Um, this is one of the reasons where he was more Aristotelian and less platonic. Um, but uh, uh, the Kantian argument is, uh, as Heidegger points out, far more radical than the Aquinian argument. The Aquinian argument turns upon the incapacity of the human mind to have an adequate concept of God, right? And Kant says, no, the problem is that you can, you, uh, that uh, existence is not the content of any concept. No concept has existence as, its con as part of its content because existence is not a real predicate. Okay, so that's the, that's the, the, the background here. Um, now, um, Heidegger will mention several times that we don't care about the, he doesn't care about the ontological group itself. He's interested in this for what we learn about existence or being, especially in Kant, but in general along the way from the scholastics and Kant. Um, so, uh, you know, a, uh, a proof of the existence of God, everyone else is interested in the God part. He's only interested in the existence part because, right, that's what he's like. But it's also, uh, it's also worth asking for each of these uh, different critics of that of the ontological argument whether or not they understood whether or not they understood the ontological argument the same way and um, whether or not their understanding of being and the understanding of being being used in the ontological argument uh, are the same he also says uh, along the way that the, the ontological argument isn't just an anselm it goes back beyond anselm to uh, uh, Bathius and to uh, Dionysus the Areopagate who we were reading in our last section so um, uh, there, there are plenty of connections here. When we were reading uh, Gilson, Being and Some Philosophers, you noticed he went over exactly the same ground that um, uh, not primarily, for, again, not primarily for the, uh, the, the, the God proof arguments, but for the sake of understanding the notions of being in the different philosophers, including the scholastics. So uh, we, we've touched on this here before. And in, in those uh, medieval scholastics, we saw that they had different theologies and some of them had theologies that were being theologies in which what they meant by God itself was something like being uh, in Avicenna, for example. Um, so a general argument that being is never um, the content of a concept or part of the content of the concept might work pretty well for most concepts, but does it work for the concept being? You have to ask yourself that because if what Avicenna means by God is being, then uh, saying that existence is not part of the content of the concept, the thing that, whose content you're trying to understand is not just some random being like a Toyota Corolla, uh, uh, but is being. Um, and that may be, that possibility may be uh, hidden by the fact that uh, a substitution rule has replaced the being concept with the God concept. Maybe to smuggle in other things, but um, 
someone tells you A is defined as B and the other person comes along and says B does not contain B, um, you're supposed to notice. And uh, Heidegger himself does not bring this out because the content of the concept of God is never a question, right? That is the particular content of it in a particular thinker is not, you know, not part of it. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm just trying to bring this out because this is one of the things about this sort of traditional problematic that Heidegger himself is not gonna focus on, but that is there as you consider these Kantian arguments. Pete, do you have a question or reaction? Yeah, so, so I guess when we have the first uh, argue, uh, problem or Kant's thesis being is not a real predicate, and he goes off into this question of the ontological existence of God. This has a ton of historical baggage with it. So without looking at the arguments for God, if we just look at a simpler statement like Santa Claus is real or exists or Santa Claus does not exist, in terms of Kant's thesis being is not a real predicate. Kant is saying that saying that Santa Claus exists or does not exist is not a real predicate. Correct. He's claiming, he's claiming, Kant claims that existence is a modal judgment, right? That it is a, uh, you're, you're saying whether or not this thing is um, possible, problematic, um, actual, you know, real or necessary follows from the structure of reason. And that, and that when you're making a judgment of existence, you're making judgments of the, those kinds, you're judging the thing's mode, you're not judging the content of the concept. And whether or not that's coherent and, uh, and what, what he has to have something like being mean to arrive there is exactly what Heidegger will be questioning. But from Kant's own understanding, he thinks of content of concept questions as being um, uh, quality judgments and existence judgments as being modality judgments. And from Kant's point of view, there, it's, there's two, two entirely different faculties of the reasons and two entirely different parts of the table of categories involved in them. So, this is also related to this thing of thinking that there's no difference between the hundred possible dollars and the and the hundred actual dollars in terms of the content of the concept. And he explains why he wants this to be the case. He wants the judgments of actuality to be about the actuality or non-actuality of precisely your, con uh, your concept of the possible. So the possible thing and the actual thing cannot differ in the content of the concept or the actual thing wouldn't be the actualization of the possible thing, right? Uh, and this is definitely a matter of where this fits into Kant's sort of uh, uh, logical linguistic scheme for understanding judgments. That's where Kant is actually getting this from. And it's not certainly not related to uh, theological questions because he would you know, it'd be true for him for any existential question. I can put this in terms of some later philosophy uh, too, although it, it, it may not uh, do full justice to Kant because the later philosophy is trying to get some of the things that Kant thinks of as modal judgments to fit into a something like a, a, a quantity judgment. But um, if something is true in all possible worlds, then it is a necessary judgment in Kant's modal sense. If something, uh, if there are some possible worlds in which something is true, then it is possible in Kant's modal judgment sense. If you judge that something is true in this actual world, then it's an existence claim in Kant's modal sense. So from the standpoint of later possible worlds thinking, right, uh, there's a connection to the uh, quantity judgment. All worlds, necessary. Some worlds, not specified whether this is one of them, possible. This world, existence. And Kant is saying that the judgment that something is an existent is saying that modally it is true in this possible world, not in all possible world by necessity, and not in some possible worlds, not uh, judging whether or not this is one of them, but in this world. 
to Kant, that is the nature of a modal judgment of existence. It's a claim about a possible truth as to whether or not it is necessary, possible, or actual. And it's making the actual judgment about it. When you say the mountain exists, you're not saying mountains are possible. You're not saying mountains are necessary. You're saying the contingently possible mount mountains that don't have to be, but might be, actually are in this world. And for Kant, that modal discrimination between merely possible and entirely necessary down to instead merely actual, if I can put it that way, actual in this world, that's what Kant means by an existence judgment. And he's claiming that existence judgments like that have exactly the same content as the possibles, but the possibles and the actuals differ in, in, in the modality of the claim. One is just being considered possible, no contradiction involved in it. And the other is being considered as actual, that it has, from Kant's point of view, some empirical support that it has, you know, that it's really true in this world. So that's what Kant is trying to mean when he separates the existence judgment from real predicates. What he means by real predicates is the content of a concept and essentiality and answer to a what question about something, what the thing is, right? Mountains that are 20,000 feet high or more, right? That's a possible mountain with a set of characteristics, right? That to him is, is, is an, an essence-like thing. It's an answer of a, to a what question. And um, um, any questions about that would be questions about the relations among the predicates of the thing, but they're not empirical questions. They're not questions about the actuality of the thing. So that's sort of how Kant is lining up, but you had a question or? So I'm, I'm just trying to get uh, this straight. So Kant, uh, for Kant, whether Santa Claus exists or not would be a question about this actual world. Uh, does he exist or not exist? Let, uh, let's find out if that's a fact. But then there's a conceptual question of does Santa Claus have a beard? And yes, if Santa Claus exists, he always has a beard by definition because that's part of being Santa Claus. And so does Santa Claus have a beard would be a real predicate. It would be a real predicate question. It doesn't necessarily have to be a necessary predicate of Santa Claus. Santa Claus, you could have a possible world in which Santa Claus shaved, but he was mm -hmm. still Santa Claus. But the, 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 it's not whether or not it's part of his essence. It's whether or not it's a what question about him. So another way of thinking about this is he thinks of the existence question as of the things that are, is one of them Santa Claus? Right. In this world, in our, our, in our world, world, in our actual world, right? And the reason that these things are easy to confuse with one another is you can say, well, you know, there's a Santa Claus that exists. He was Saint Nicholas and he was some saint in the Eastern, you know, uh, empire, but he doesn't fly around and bring presents to people on New Year's Eve, right? Or Christmas Eve, rather. Um, so so uh, uh, in that sense, there's a Santa Claus that doesn't exist who's a fictional character. And there's a, a Saint Nicholas who did exist, who is a historical character. Right, and if you make those distinctions, you're making what distinctions? You're distinguishing one essence from another, and you might have a different judgment about the existence of one than the existence of the other. So because those possibilities exist, it's sometimes possible to conflate a what question with an is question, but that Kant thinks that that's a confusion when it happens. And he thinks that's the kind of confusion that's going on in the ontological argument. That's his claim. Um, and when the ontological argument is, is, as put forward by Anselm, is based upon a, a, uh, most, a, a best thinkable idea that might actually work, if it's Avicenna, it's much less clear that it works. Why? Because Avicenna's uh, notion of what he wants the ontological argument to be about is not, uh, is meant to be predicated not in Kant's terms as an existence claim, it's meant to be posited as a necessity claim. It's meant to be what Kant later dismiss, uh, dismisses as, as a, uh, a, a, a mere tawdry tautology, right? Kant doesn't want the uh, existence of God claim to be a mere tautology. So he needs it to be an actual existence claim. 
And it's an actual existence claim that he claims that it's not a, it can never be a what, a what claim. Um, but understand there are people in the theological tradition for whom God and being are synonyms, who, or who talk about necessary being, and for whom ne uh, necessary being would have being tautologically predicable of its essence. Meant to be in Kant's modal terms, not a contingent truth, not an empirical truth, uh, not a uh, modality of uh, that is, is an assertion of an existence, but meant to be a, a necessary, a, a, a truth of reason, a mere tautology. Um, and there are people like Avicenna for whom that would be true. Um, and the point is Kant's argument would not reach them except to denounce what they're doing as a mere tautology. Um, Kant's argument is meant to be directed at people who claim an existence in the contingent limited sense that it is both possible and actual in this world, as opposed to claiming that it is some necessary truth of reason. That's the existence claim he's, he's interested in. Someone isn't making an existence claim that God exists in the sense that it is actual in this actual world, not merely possible and not merely some necessary tautological truth of reason. That's the existence claim he's thinks he's arguing against, that he's arguing against being possible from an ontology, being possible from a um, from an essence. Joe, question. Uh, just to clarify in my own mind, <clears throat> Descartes ended up with uh, proofing, proving God somehow in, in Descartes' system. Mm -hmm. Is that because Descartes was making a necessary claim? Um, not quite. Uh, he he argues for the he argues from the cause of his concept of God, so it's it's a variation oh, like, on the, like Aquinas did like Aquinas, not like Aquinas. Aquinas uses the first cause argument. the 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 argument in in Descartes is a is a slight variation on the Anselm argument, where he doesn't say um, this concept must contain its, its its existence. He says my idea of God had to come from somewhere, and he doesn't think it can come from something less than God. That's the argument that Descartes actually gives. So it's not quite the Anselm argument, and it's definitely not the Avicenna um, uh, being equals God definition sort of thing. Um, but it sort of sounds like a necessary argument because he he got the idea from someplace. It must he, be from. He, he, <laughs> it's 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 a claim about the genetic necessity of the idea, but not of the. It's not a first cause argument of the world like you get in Aquinas. Mm -hmm. Or Aristotle, okay. yeah, fair, okay. fair question. But but uh, I would put it as um, Descartes' argument turns upon the notion of innate ideas, um, but is not simply any of the scholastic traditional arguments. Um, um, but but yes, he does he, he does try to give it a, 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 an argument like that. Um, would Kant reject that for a? Um, for his, his uh, uh, not a real predicate uh, reason. Not simply, not simply on that basis. He, Descartes is making an argument which is less vulnerable to Kant's criticism than Anselm's argument is. Anselm thinks you can, de you can deduce uh, uh, a ne necessity of existence from the content of the what concept of, of God. And in that respect, um, Kant says you can never make such a deduction because you can't deduce the is from the what, basically, um, for anything that isn't necessarily true, anything which isn't which is uh, anyway contingent. Um, okay, but all, all of that is just I'm just trying to lay out what Kant thought he was doing with the argument, um, how he thinks it goes through, where it fits into his scheme, and and the critical thing from my point of view to understand about Kant's scheme there is it wasn't based upon some prior doctrine of what being means based on any kind of phenomenology of being like you get from a Husserl or a Heidegger. It was instead based upon the classification of judgments, the classifications of types of statements. Kant's one of these logic chopping philosophers who thinks everything can be understood in terms of the statements you can make about it. Both the truth and mankind are propositional creatures, right? There are a set of true propositions and the set of true propositions and true judgments is the truth, right? There's no, there's no slip between sets of propositions, sets of truths, the world, right? You know, this is a little reminiscent of the, you know, all the things which are the case of, of early Wittgenstein, right? 
um, the same sort of propositional, you know, a set of propositions of sufficient sense. So what, what Kant does is he divides all the propositions in terms of you know, a few distinctions we made about them. You know, are they positive or negative? You know, are they categorical or hypothetical, right? Um, are they about universal things or single things, right? And are they uh, problematic assertions or apodictic? And in that uh, you know, typology of what a judgment can be, the ones which are just which are assertions, right? They're claim. They're they're we would say empirical claims. They're claims about what is, right? That are not meant to be apodictic truths, and they're not meant to be simply possible, but they're actual. We would say actual. You know, contentful, actual for this world truth claims. Those are what he calls um, assertion judgments, and that's this. That's the class into which he puts all existential statements of the form. You know, A is. So if it's an assertion of the form A is, you're not saying A is merely possible and you're not saying A is necessary, uh, although you could, you could assert that both those, the A is necessary and the A is actual fall into the same thing, but he distinguishes them. The A is when it might not be sort of claim is what he means by the assertion category of modality. Okay, fine. But Heidegger quite reasonably asks, what the heck do you think the person is saying about the thing he's asserting then? And Kant's answer is, the only, th only answer you can give to it is, mm, you're positing it. You're putting the claim in absolute position. And Heidegger finds this less than clear. What is this position business into which you're putting something when you're, when you're uh, claiming it? And Kant also tries to say something like, um, you're putting it into a different relationship to your to your to the thinking subject, a different relationship to the to the cognitive faculty. You're trying to say that it's something like perceivable, or could have been perceived. And what, in later uh, philosophy of science terms, Kant is trying to say there is something like, this is an empirical truth. This is not a necessary truth of reason, and it's not a near possibility. It's something which happens to be true, but how do you know that, that something which isn't necessary happens to be true? Well, you went and looked, right? You know, you, you, you have empirical support for it, right? He's, he's, he's appealing to the, it's not a mere logical possibility and it's not a mere uh, logical necessity. It's something which might've been otherwise, but in fact isn't. And so he's, he's calling that the absolute, the putting the thing in absolute position and he's appealing to something like perception as the support for it. Uh, or perceive, perceivedness, and, and, and Heidegger goes into great length about, you know, is he talking about perception in the sense that I have to perceive it for it to exist? He certainly can't be meaning that, right? Um, so Kant is less than clear on it, but, but the, the direction he's trying to point to is all motivated by this set of logical distinctions you can make about kinds of uh, judgments or kinds of statements. And he's trying to delimit the statement that you think um, doesn't have to be true, but actually is true. And that's the place where he sees this judgment of existence. Okay, so we have to contrast this with, with um, uh, Christian Wolff, the, the philosophy based upon Leibniz primarily that Kant is immediately reacting to. Um, what, is, what does Christian Wolff say about what being means? He says, existence is the complement of um, a complement of, which is actuality, is the complement of possibility. And this may not be clear because he doesn't understand what he means by, means by complement. But to think about it this way, what I mean by complement in general is, you know, if uh, uh, let S be a set of state, uh, a set of things A, B, C, and D, right? Then the complement of uh, B, C, B, C, D with respect to S is A, right? It's all the things that are left out of the previous set, okay? So when he wants to point out to you what actuality means, he's trying to tell you, it's the, that thing that you add to the possible thing that makes it an actual thing. That's what I mean by being, that's what I mean by existence, right? He's trying to take the, the actual thing in front of you and factor it into the possible thing and whatever was extra, right? But he's thinking of that as an extra. He's thinking of that as, as an extra piece of the concept, as an extra determination of the concept. What extra determination of the concept? Well, in Suarez, the answer is actuality. Right? It's like you've got all these all these things about the possible thing, and then you add actuality to it, you actualize it. Now it's now it's a now it's an existent. Right? That's the that's the 
Christian Wolf position, trying to you know agree with Leibniz and motivated in large part by Suarez. So the idea, they have the idea that you are adding something real to the hundred dollars when they're actual. You're adding actuality to them. So actuality is just another domain of distinction. How, what currency? Dollars. How many? One hundred. Uh, existent or not? Yes, actual. Right, and that that's just another direction of the distinction between actual and possible. So, but they're they're pointing to that as if you know the difference between the actual thing and the, and the possible thing, then I can point out that the difference between those two is what I mean by actuality. Well, great. You just told me that if you want to understand actuality, understand actuality. Right. That's the reason Kant is, you know, Kant is uh, not very um, impressed by this. Um, and also, he thinks that it's misunderstanding the content of concepts judgments for the, it, not only is it or is it not, but in what degree or manner is it? Is it necessary? Is it possible? Or is it actual? That's what Kant means by mode. Okay, so anyway, I'm just explaining where Kant is positioning himself with respect to the philosophy before him and why Kant thinks he's making progress over them and he's understanding something like actuality better than they did. Because he understands actuality, not just as actual versus possible, but as actual versus possible versus necessary as a specific mode of judgment of the relationship between the posited truth to the mind in terms of how necessary or not it is. Okay. So far, I'm just explaining Kant. None of, none of this is um, Heidegger reacting to Kant at all. Any questions about that just Kant piece of it? Joe, is uh, you're satisfied with the explanation? You had, wouldn't have seen this before, but it makes sense now. <laughs> okay. I, I might have I might have had uh, you know an awareness of this as I read through it because this is what, what he was telling us. Uh, but you made it very clear by bringing it together in a nice summary, summary way. Okay. Um, uh, I wanna just give a, a little bit of prehistory of this problem before we go ahead to Heidegger's problems with Kant's solution, right? A little bit of the prehistory of the problem. And now I'm talking about not the God problem, but the ex existence problem, right? In the scholastics. So they're considering uh, an actual existent thing in front of you. Right, and the question is: Is the essence of that thing and the existence of that thing are they different? And Aquinas said, "Yes, they're different. There's a real distinction between the existence of the thing in front of you and the essence of the thing in front of you. The existence is, of the thing in front of you is something over and above its essence, in addition to its essence, and there's a real distinction between them." Okay, that's the position, uh, position of Aquinas, and it's the position that. Kant is rejecting here when he says that existence is not a real predicate. Dun Scotus said instead that there's only a, a, uh, a modal or formal distinction between them. Once the thing is, if the thing was uh, only possible, there would be a, a distinction between them. But once the thing is actual, its essence and its existence coincide. And the only modal distinction between them is in one case, the actual thing in front of you, you're considering it in the mode of existent. And when you're considering it only its essence, when you're abstracting its essence out of it, you're considering it only in the mode of it being possible. But that's a considering, considering by you in your mind. So Duns Scotus says there's only a modal distinction between them. There's not a real distinction between them. The distinction between them is in your head. It's not out in the, it's not out in the real world. Now, the only part of it that is out in the real world is it actually is actually a modal distinction of a possible versus actual transition between the two. That's the Duns Scotus position on the difference between essence and actuality of an existent thing. So hundreds of years after them, Suarez comes along and is considering the debate between the two. And he, you know, doesn't agree with the real distinction part, but he thinks that Suarez even doesn't quite go far enough. And he says, there is really only a distinction of reason between them. That is, he says the distinction between them is actually in your mind, right? So yes, the possible thing and the actual thing differ. They differ in actuality. Actuality is a specific difference between them. But the only thing you need to act to a possible to make it an actual is, is, is the actualization. And once the thing is actualized, there is only a, a mere distinction of reason between the existent thing and the essence of the thing. In fact, they coincide. In external reality, they coincide. Your mind can draw a distinction between them because your mind considered the existent thing as having, not having existed before, 
but that's you making hypothetical something which is actually real. That's the Suarez position. All of those positions happen before Kant's reaction, right? And Kant wants to say all of the, the, the essence of the actual thing and the essence of the, of, of, the, uh, of the possible thing are exactly the same. They differ only in the modal judgment your mind makes about them. Now, to me, it's quite clear that's closest to Suarez of the three, right? Some might see it as being closer to Duns Scotus, but it's, it's, in the, it's definitely not on the Aquinian side of that distinction. And it's, it's probably closer to the Suarez than to the Duns Scotus answer to that traditional question. Okay. In that sense, Kant isn't the only one who said that uh, we can think of uh, re being as not being a real predicate in some sense. Some of that was already, see already seen in some of the later scholastics. This will matter because we get in the next chapter, we'll be talking about essence and existence and the distinction between them, right? That's gonna be the whole subject of chapter two. And some of that's gonna be traced back to Aristotle rather than just in scholastics. But I thought it'd be useful to give you the positions on whether or not there is a distinction between essence and existence in an existent particular in the scholastics. Because Heidegger alludes to it here and he knows all that stuff well, but he's not talking about that stuff primarily in this chapter. Okay. Um, questions about the real, real or not distinction between essence and existence? We'll get into that in greater detail no, next, no, next no chapter. No more question, but that was very helpful. Uh, coincidentally, I spent this morning talking about Duns Scotus. <laughs> okay, yeah. But as, as, as usual, I understand Heidegger, but I understand why I'm implacably opposed. But, but that's <laughs> We haven't even gotten to Heidegger's position on these things yet. So far, we're just on, just on uh, 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 the scholastics and Kant, but uh, understood. Um, okay, but, uh, okay. Um, Siri, let me know if I can help. I think Siri just woke up. I'm gonna make her go away. Um, I don't think Siri can help. We were speaking before about whether artificial intelligence is possible, but I don't think Siri can help with this one. Um, uh, so, so sorry about that. Let's now get to uh, um, Heidegger's reaction to Kant's um, problem slash explanation. Fundamentally, he doesn't think that Kant has explicated um, uh, being enough by just saying it's not a real predicate as its negative as its negative claim and saying that. The positive way to understand it is something like position. And one of the more sections which seems may seem more contradictory than others is he goes through that and he says, you know, Kant says that being is mere position. Kant says that being is absolute position. Kant says the judgment of existence is putting something in absolute position. Um, and in some of that, he's just trying to bring out the, the, the uh, somewhat inconsistent nature of Kant's own language on the subject. Because whether or not he says, position, absolute position or mere position, depends upon whether or not he's trying to contrast the actual thing to the possible thing, or uh, he's trying to talk about uh, uh, just the, the, the possible thing with its essence, right? There's sort of two different directions of, of relation. In both of them, he says, position is the thing that points in the existence direction, but one of them is mere position as opposed to essence, and the other it's absolute position when it's the modal judgment. And Kant is not entirely clear on those, those two different directions of distinction because he, he uses mere position for one of them and absolute position for the other one of them and doesn't tell you how any of them are different. But the, the fundamental thing that's going on here is that uh, when he has to tell you positively what he means by saying something is in being, Kant just says, you're putting it into position. You're setting it set, uh, sites, uh, gesites, the thing is positioned, the thing is gesites, the gesets, right? Now, one of the reasons this gives, uh, this seems uh, intuitive to Kant as being sufficient is he's almost starting from this notion that um, the set of propositional claims that can be put down by the mind that are true is the world, right? And Kant is not Kant. Heidegger is not coming from that place at all, right? But but Kant kind of is without arguing for it. And Heidegger is kind of pointing out he hasn't really argued for that. What the heck does he mean by putting something in position? You're not picking something up, right? Your your um, in your set of 
beliefs or descriptions about what is, you're trying to give a positive truth content to a particular proposition. And that is called putting it into position or positing it. And the set of all things that you posit is what you think is true about the world or something like that. That's the sort of you know background idea that Kant has when he thinks that he's saying something extra that will be clear when he says, you're putting it into position. But it's not clear. It's it's it seems to be a kind of reference to a uh, uh, a geometrical intuition in logic space about truth or something like that. But in those terms, it's just a metaphor, and it's not telling us what being means. So I, I think that uh, Heidegger is right that Kant is much less clear there than he thinks he's being. Right? Kant thinks that he's can add clarity to what being means by saying being is position and that confuses more than it clarifies. Um, okay. Question. Can I say a few things? Sure. So first, um, I believe there was somewhere where Heidegger says that Kant after he wrote the first version of the critique of pure reason and he kind of hinted to this kind of what being is. And then when he, on the second edition, he kind of toned down everything and remove it. So that's one thing, and because, as you say, probably Kant was not was not comfortable or not clear what to, to say about being. The the second thing I think Kant somewhere I think it's in Being in Time where he says that there is a scandal that the real is not proved, like there is a demonstration that there is real, and he's trying to do something, but again Heidegger is saying it's it's nonsense what he's doing, it's it's not working, and. Going back to the argument of the existence of God, to me, like, I, I agree with what you said, but to me, the, the simple form of this argument is like being, God is the perfect being, and because it's the perfect being has a lot of these good attributes, and one is existence, and pretty much Kant is objecting to this, which is exactly the same you say, but to me, it's the shorter form, and that's it. Sure. So, uh, but in in Anselm, right? I mean, you could you could argue against the Anselm proof by saying, you know, how does he know that existence is a, is a perfection? How does he know that something is better if it exists than if it doesn't? Right. There's, there's all kinds of pla different possible places where you could try to attack Anselm proof. Um, or, you know, where does he get the notion that you, that you know that than which nothing greater can be conceived is the is a is the appropriate conception of God? Right. So there's lots of other ways you could attack Anselm proof, but Kant's what Kant is trying to do is say, you cannot have uh, existence be inside the concept of something because existence is exactly adding the claim that the thing actually is to the, to the merely possible that all essences are. For, for Kant, all essences are merely possibles. And the, when you're saying that something is actual, you're adding to concept. You're doing something which isn't just conceptual anymore when you're making existence claims. You're moving outside conceptual world to an actual world. In that sense, Kant is more Aristotelian than the people who formulated the ontological argument are, who are all Platonists, right? And and just just along this line, isn't that what kind of Leibniz is trying to do? Like basically collapse the all the logical says is real when he said that we are living in the best possible world? Sure, I mean, Le Le Leibniz uh, certainly agrees with the ontological argument. Le uh, he doesn't have an objection to it. He, he, he's, he would agree with Anselm, right? Which is one of the reasons why Kant is still trying to refute that proof because you know, the Christian wolf people around him are followers of Leibniz. And for them, you know, the, the ontological argument is one example of the arguments for a deistic God that they, that they believe in. And uh, people afterwards said, said of the Creek of Pure Reason that it was the sword with which deism was slain in Germany. It was Heinrich Kind, right? So they're trying to, he's, he's taking down deism by uh, uh, destroying an argument that, that Leibniz before him would have accepted. But um, so, but I'm just making the point that some of that is that existence claim notions in Kant are more like uh, empirical claims to a Platonist, which I don't know to it, to an Aristotelian, and less like um, content of uh, uh, metaphysical ideas claims to a Platonist. So, so I'm just, wh which, of these are, which of these people think which arguments go through is, is sometimes just turning on, are they more Platonist or are they more Aristotelian? Um, and just, you can notice that through the history, like Aquinas says no, and Kant says no, and you know Leibniz says yes, and Descartes says a different version of yes, right? Um, and 
what do they think of Aristotle, right? Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, but uh, I want to talk a little about just what the, the real versus actual. Um, uh, this might have already been clear. Some of the, we got a bunch of this already in uh, you know a year ago when we were reading Gilson. Um, but the uh, uh, Heidegger himself points out that in his own day, people used real to mean something like external reality, to mean something like actuality, and that that isn't what Kant means, right? Kant is following this scholastic usage where something being real means it's independent of the content of a single uh, human mind, right? And uh, uh, it's not a matter of opinion, right? But especially, but basically, the realm of essences is, is what he's thinking of as the realm of the real. So all of all of mathematics is in the realm of the real. It's not in the realm of the actual at all, right? The realm of the actual, in the scholastic sense, means affected by the category of time, is in act, right? Um, and that's different from uh, from from the real. And, and you know where you locate uh, a mathematical truth is a perfect example of how to see that these distinctions don't coincide, right? Mathematical truths are real, they're not actual, right? In the, in the scholastic usage. And Kant is basically following that scholastic usage <coughs> around, the, around his own time, um, um, out of his own time, there were plenty of people who did use real in the sense that maybe the colloquial man the uses today to mean something more like actual. Joe? Uh, just a, um, a, a silly question. So when people use the, con the claim uh, in actual time, uh, are they sort of using yeah, some terminology that's inconsistent uh, with the... Uh, I mean, uh, if they're trying to talk about something about the uh, different natures of time, then maybe not, right? They could be talking about actual time versus objective time or something like that. Um, <clears throat> or, you know, uh, uh, I, I sometimes when, I'm, when we're talking about... Uh, 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 projects. We'll talk about, you know, calendar time versus, you know, uh, uh, work time because we know there's going to be breaks. You know, it, it, you can use actual time in, in, in a way which is uh, not confused. But um, nor normally, to say that something is actual is to say that something is in act, which is to say that it's enacted, that it, you know, uh, it does the act of existing for itself, right? Um, and there are some understandings of time or temporality that would uh, include things which are eternal outside of time in the actual in that sense, but there are exceptions. The ordinary colloquial understanding of actual is transpires in time. So to me, my favorite distinctions are um, a mathematical truth is not actual in that sense. You know, two plus two equals four did not happen on a day, right? Um, so, uh, but it is real. And on the other hand, my subjective impression of, you know, this particular red right now actually transpires in time, it's actual, but I can't share it with you. I can show you the thing and you can have your own subjective impression of it. My ex, my, the actual sense of that qualia to me right now is not something public enough, independent enough of one mind, but I can share it with you. In that sense, it's not real because real has to be independent enough of a mind that uh, it could be something which is thought of as being in the object, not, not as being in the mind, right? Re real means independent of opinion. It has to have that kind of exteriority to it to count as real. Um, so, but things which don't have that can still happen, right? So uh, the point is that real and actual are two different distinctions and they, they don't have to coincide because, you know, any two distinctions you uh, don't have to. Um, so that, anyway, that actually, yeah. Jeff, question? That, that, that really helps. <laughs> I, I was in a Deleuze group for, for over a year, and, and every time the virtual came up, and it was, it was contrasted with the actual, we, we got into all these, <laughs> yes. you know, arguments that never, never led anywhere. And, and so you're reminding me that, that basically, I uh, think Deleuze actually, like, like uh, Kant, I think he's really he's responding to the scholastics, whereas nowadays people read stuff and they assume that it's, you know, in the frame of modern or analytic philosophy or something and it really is all and, and it, it, it actually what made me realize that earlier was that that you know uh, uh deleuze is, is basically following kant in, in in responding to the faculties the whole idea of the faculties mm -hmm. is from medieval philosophy that that's that's not modern it's but this so it is it is a reaction to the 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 rise of modern philosophy so now we're going to go back to the drawing board there was a wrong turn somewhere so so that, that yes. helps place some, yes 
No very, question. And, and, and this is true of a lot of the stuff that you certainly get in Heidegger. It's a phenomenology in other people in the 20th century. There's plenty of people where they say, some scholastics had some of these problems uh, more right than you think, and modern philosophy was too flipped to dismiss them and think that they were con uh, concerned about things, distinctions that aren't real or something like that. Um, and there's also just ways in which people since have learned that there are um, continual indebtednesses to, to things from scholasticism in a lot of early modern philosophy, ways in which Descartes was de de uh, dependent upon Suarez, for example. Um, so so uh, in, in that sense, the I would say that people's appreciation, both for the content of scholastic philosophy, but also for the ways in which um, its concepts survive and influence uh, later thinking, uh, not always consciously, has certainly increased uh, since the early 20th century when a lot of work was done on sort of neo-scholasticism and understanding these things better. Um, and it's certainly the case a lot of continental philosophy is sort of more aware of those things than a lot of Anglo-Saxon philosophy was. They sort of didn't take part in all that. Um, but uh, that's not to say that there aren't different takes on, on you know, errors of scholasticism too, right? Um, Kant, Kant is someone who thinks of scholastics as all being dogmatic philosophers as opposed to critical philosophers. They're too easy. They too easily think that they can just, you know, po posit what is, what, uh, what is knowable because they had a notion about it instead of, you know, being epistemologically rigorous or something. You know, that, that sort of notion is, is there in Kant as well that he used to try to distinguish himself, you know, after skepticism a la Hume from previous philosophy. So he would lump together the scholastics and Leibniz and Descartes as being too, dog too dogmatic and not you know, epistemologically informed enough by skepticism or something. So there's different um, transitions along the way than, than that one. But, but yes, uh, I think that you know, understanding of real and Deleuze is definitely indebted to knowing these things, um, including from Heidegger. Yeah, yeah, and, and just on a related point, a very closely related point. The uh, uh, yeah, when I was when I was in the the analytic group, you know, I, I would like see, you know, so these arguments they sound familiar, and then once I ran across Aquinas, you know, one of one of the twelve arguments was this is okay. We really should read the Summa Theologica <laughs> because I think a lot of what you're doing is just is just recapitulating that. But of course, they didn't want to do that. So. <laughs> yes, yes, fair fair enough. Um, okay, so we, but I, I would say. Uh, uh, we didn't really cover it in the introduction. In the introduction, he mentioned, um, the very end of the introduction, he mentioned uh, destruction or deconstruction uh, down to the roots. Um, that's sort of what he's actually doing here. And when he's talking about, and this is sort of the original from which the later French version came from, um, what he's doing here where he's looking at Kant, where Kant is most concerned about the ontological argument um, and instead looking away from that concern towards what is he actually saying about being here or thinking about being here as the thing which he wants to really get at. Like, I don't care about the analogical argument. What, what were you thinking about being when you said that, right? That, that's the example of the kind of um, uh, critical deconstruction down to the base experiences thing uh, that he talked about at the, at the end of the intro. Um, and it's the characteristic Heideggerian thing to do, right? He, he's, he's, uh, he will understand what the original philosopher had as his motivations and is problematic and he'll take it seriously enough, but then he's going to go depart on his own. And he's going to be interested in what he had to say about his Heidegger's problematic, not just what he said about his original, his original concerns. So he's going to take what Kant discovered about being and uh, both criticize it and run with it, so to speak, um, rather than simply stick with Kant's problematic. Um, okay. Uh, I have a question. Then. Sure. Uh, so, uh, so Kant is saying existence is absolute position. Yes. And and that that we're talking about, you know, the actual existence in the actual world, not a mathematical correct uh, existence or gene. And so. I, if I was going to interpret that in terms of Santa Claus, so if I say Santa Claus exists, to Kant, that would mean he has to occupy an absolute position somewhere at the present time. Uh, and that means that nothing else is occupying that uh, absolute position. I don't it's, think so. I don't think he means position in that sort of sense. Because he doesn't mean position in a spatial sense. He doesn't mean position in a you know exist in space and time sense. He's talking about position in something like logical space. He's talking about position in truth. 
but it but the, that's so actual now means in logical space i thought the real was in logical space and the absolute was a material yes, the, the, the difference is that the that the uh the the the, the, the real is logical space considered as possible an absolute position is meant to be something like position as being in itself or for itself in logical space in truth and have you neither of them neither neither it's not well if it were proven mathematically it would only be it would be necessary and you okay. you, you judge it you judge it by the by the category of necessary if it's considered but isn't, and it just doesn't have a contradiction in it, then it's possible. For Kant, the actual occupies this weird immediate, posi immediate, immediate position. It doesn't contain a contradiction in that sense it's possible. It doesn't follow from a truth of reason, so it's not, it's not necessary. It is, we like to say, contingent, but it's true. So the contingently true is the specific modality that Kant wants to reserve for claims of existence. So it's it's not that it's uh, it's not in the logical space of it's not that it's located in physical space. It's not doesn't mean position in that sense. I'm not saying it has an x, y, and z coordinate. He's saying that we're positing it as true, right? We're positing it as as existent. All of our judgments about it, but we're also positing it as not merely possible, but actually true, and as not simply necessary, but actually true. Didn't have to be, but it is. So this didn't have to be, but it is, is what he's getting at as the judgment of existence. That's the specific mode he thinks is involved in a judgment of existence. It didn't have to be, but it is. And that's why he reaches towards perception as a way of trying to explain or ground this. He's trying to get at something like what we mean by an empirical as opposed to a necessary truth, right? And epistemologically, you'd say it's because there's some support for it, which comes from our senses. That's what he's trying to say by trying to link it to perception. We don't just know that it follows the truth of logic. We do know that it's not self-contradictory, but we're adding something more to the fact that it's just not self-contradictory and not necessarily true. We're adding and it actually is. And the sense of positing there is something like, you know, we, 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 we can posit it, we can, we can claim that it is truth, we can advance the extra truth claim about it. And then you could ask, well, why would you do that if it's not necessarily true? And it's Kant sort of hems and haws and says, well, it's something to do with perception, right? Because he's trying to point towards something like an empirically, empirical, empirically known contingent truth. But he doesn't really care whether or not it's actually empirically known. It's just sort of like empirically knowable. So he, he, so he gives this, this uh, long-winded locution like, um, you consider that it could have been perceived before it is perceived or before its concept was known, right? You, 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 you know that a, that, that a Santa Claus is actual. If you can meet him on the street before you knew what Santa Claus was, if it's the kind of thing you can meet on the street before you knew its concept, then it's a empirical thing. That's sort of the notion he's trying to get at. And, and this is, you know, pointing, he does this by pointing towards absolute position by pointing towards perception. But all of those are, are Heidegger points out, just marks of the thing be having anything like being. They're external signs you might use to determine it. They're not the thing itself you're determining, right? What is this thing you're determining? All Kant can tell him is absolute position. What the heck does that mean? It's not clear. That's Heidegger's critique of, of this of this understanding. But from Kant's own motivation, you know, he's got this category of judgment that sits between possible and necessary for the empirically true or something. And for the empirically true aspect of it, he can just point to perception as the link to experience, right? But it's it, it's it's not that it needs to have that. It's sort of like it needs to be possible to have that so that it can fall into this realm of isn't just possibly true, but is actually true. Now, not to flash, not, not to, not to uh, uh, give away too much, um, Heidegger thinks that there's something correct about pointing in this empirical direction, but that Kant hasn't understood it correctly. He didn't understand 
what was priorly necessary for something like that empirical relationship to be there. And eventually he's gonna have that actual, that notion of actuality be understood in terms of the categories of time by the time we get to the end, right? The actual as being in time, having this timely character and contingency are gonna be connected, right? But that's like way down the road when, when he comes out to try to explain how being is always understood upon the horizon of time, right? Here, all he's saying is Kant can't tell us. He can just say it's something with absolute position and point in the direction of, of empirical reality, but it's not quite clear why it would be related to perception or what part of perception would be related to. But so help? absolute position does depend on perception. It's it depends. This is the whole. This is the thing. I mean, it, it's it depend. It depends upon something like a possible perceivedness. That we it's possible that there is phenomena to support. Yes, it. it's it's like it's like to, to to speak science. They're trying to say this is an observable or this is a falsifiable, right? He doesn't actually get to the notion of falsifiable. He's not you know he's not uh, proper before the letter, right? Mm -hmm. But he gets the notion of something like a this is an this is in principle and observable right so, so in science we can make the distinction between theoretical where we say well all the math works and is true and then we have the empirical where we say we looked at the phenomena and we measured it mm -hmm. and it's true mm -hmm. and so there's a distinction between... right but, but realize in the last case right i could look at the phenomena and see that it's true but the thing that I'm noticing winds up being tautolog tautologically true, necessarily true. Because all measurements are tautologically true. Not because all measurements are, but that particular one. I noticed that energy was conserved in this transaction, in this interaction. Is that an empirical truth? Or is it how I defined energy? Right? So, so, so the point is some of these things have a fu funny status about how necessary they are. They, they're certainly possible in the sense the math is not contradictory, but some of them you can tell, right, you know, at least within a certain theory, they seem to be empirical. What is the mass of the tau, right? It's a free parameter of the theory. It has to be observed, right? Now, maybe later you come up with some other theory where the mass of the tau is a necessary consequence of an underlying structure. And then you move something that previously was an empirical truth to something which is a necessary truth. Your modal judgment of it changes, right? But what Kant is trying to get at is something like those empirical truths that are only contingently true. In possible worlds terms, we'd say there, there are things about which you're trying to claim they are true in this world. You're not trying to claim they're true in all possible worlds. You're not trying to claim they're true in some possible worlds. You're trying to claim they're true in this world. But, but all this notion of, you know, what do you mean by the this and the this world as opposed to all the possibilities when you don't know everything? What do you mean by this thing being, you know, an empirical parameter as opposed to something which is the result of an underlying mathematical structure when you don't know all the underlying mathematical structures, right? Gets slippery. And so all Kant is really able to do is say something like, I wanna say that it's contingently absolutely true and I can point to something like it could have been perceived as the right direction to go if you want to understand how you can know a contingent truth, right? So th that's, I think, as far as Heidegger thinks Kant gets. You know, he's got a category of judgments where this sort of category of thing makes sense, and he's got a direction to point you towards to uh, let you know something like how something which is merely contingently true might be true, and the part about it being true, he's going to explain as absolute position in something like, you know, uh, putting a check mark or a one next to it in, in, in a logical possible space, right? But that's, it's all very, it's all very uh, um, uh, metaphorical, imagistic, pointing. And there are times when Kant is blindingly clear and everything follows from his concepts. And this is not one of those times. And that's sort of the other point that Heidegger is bringing out. Yeah, that's the thing. Starting with Kant, I was just really taken with this, this this focus on the pure, right? Which I think is really what we're at, right? Because he's trying to say oh, everything that's empirical is not that interesting philosophically. I want to figure out what 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 could be 
what what is that, that 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 there really couldn't be any other way but it seemed like the argument for why it couldn't be, be any other way always came down to a failure of imagination on, on Kant's part so I just, mm-hmm. so there is room here <laughs> to improve on Kant when we get to Heidegger's position yeah but I mean I think there's there's something interesting about uh even if you're trying to do a priori philosophy right the a priori philosophy has some position for something like the empirical and uh and the empirically true and the question is, does it understand that adequately? And, and what Heidegger is claiming is that he has a more adequate understanding of how something like um, uh, contingent empir- empirical truth happens as truth. And that these logic choppy philosophies that are trying to think that, that by categorizing statements into, into logic, different logical categories, they're going to uh, arrive at that they have a problem. They're not directly looking at the phenomena itself. They'll t- say, oh, this will be something that's about, about observation or something about perceivedness. It'll be over there in the perceivedness thing, right? It's like they want to take care of all the rest of the problem, but have the part which is actually about uh, direct perception of, of a contingent truth. They want it to be over in some tiny little box they don't have to worry about very much. And Heidegger is saying, no, that's actually the whole game how the human Dasein has, has direct access to something like the truth in which it lives is the whole game, is, is Heidegger's claim. Um, and that's what we get in the second half of this first chapter where he brings up intentionality and then he gets into his, his counterexamples. Um, okay. That actually, that, that helps too. That gets to why, why Heidegger is regard, regarded as more poetic than the uh, and Kant. I mean, if there's some experience. Yes. Yeah. Well, experience definitely. Uh, so uh, I, page 63, I just have to give you, this is one of my favorite uh, uh, little passages in this whole book, right? Um, Let us take a natural perception without any theory, without any preconceived opinion about the relationship of subject to object and other such matters. And let us interrogate this concrete perception in which we live, say the perception of the window. Toward what does it direct itself? That is the perception, protect itself and correspond to a particular sense of direction its intention toward what is the perceiving directed in conformity with the peculiar perceptual sense by which it is guided. In everyday behavior, say I'm moving around this room, taking a look around my environment, I perceive the wall and the window. To what am I directed in this perception? To sensations? Or when I avoid what is perceived, am I turning aside from representational images and taking care not to fall out of these representational images and sensations into the courtyard of the university building? His point is that there's something about the subjectivizing, turning all these things into sensations and representations and impressions that is, you know, starkly at odds with the, with the actual practical orientation of you, you, you manage to avoid falling out of the window, right? And your reasons for wanting to avoid falling out of the window have remarkably little to do with uh, impressions, sensations, and representations. They are way more operational than that. They are way more practical than that. And the way he brings this out is by taking all of these, you know, theories and bringing them back to the uh, practical life world in which the existence is being lived, right? And point out all the practical uh, structures that it is connected to. And, and for him, that's the right phenomenological frame in which to criticize all of these theories. You don't live in your sensations, you live in the world. You don't avoid walking into sensations, you avoid walking into walls. Right? And your reason for doing so is if you fall out into the, uh, of the window into the courtyard of the university building, your Dasein comes to an untimely end, right? Okay, so um, that's, that's the sort of uh, phenomenological orientation to these things that you get in being in time and you get hints of here, going through intentionality first. Um, okay, so... Uh, He's trying to get at what, what we actually add, add to perception. This is in, you know, basically page 50 on. Um, and there's two main things here. One is the whole understanding of intentionality and there's all the stuff that comes after intentionality. Joe, is there a question? Oh, um, so I wanna, I wanna start just on the intentionality part, right? Uh, he, he introduces it with a fair amount of hemming and hawing of, you know, uh, uh, does this look trivial? You know, is this yet even philosophy, right? To 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 it, intention uh, belongs and intended, right? Uh, but uh, just 
I don't know how much uh, background other uh, people here have. I know Pete has some, but uh, in either um, Heideggerian or Husserlian phenomenology, to know what this intention uh, uh, business is and why it might be uh, critical or important. Did anyone else um, follow this, have problems with this, understand what this is and isn't about? What is intentionality? Well, I sort of got it because we went through the Husserl book about, uh, you know, six, eight, nine, ten months ago. And so I had already an inkling of, you know, Husserl's idea that uh, it's, a, it's like the leading up to having an idea without actually being there yet. And, and so I got that idea pointing to it. And so Heidegger picking that up, it, it seemed to fit right in and I didn't, wasn't confused. Yes. So, uh, how about his example of the uh, the guy who is uh, who mistakes the um, tree for a man while he's out walking at night, and he explains what well, the what the intended is in that perception. The intended is for him to go up and, and meet that man, or or to uh, find out Correct. what that man is doing. As he gets closer, his eyes get better, and he might realize that uh, the man was an illusion. Correct. But point is, the point as, is, he as he approached the original idea, he thought he was going to see a man. Correct. So the, the point is here, in understanding intention, you have to understand that when the man is related to the uh, what he thinks is a man, but is actually a tree, it is the man that is the intende, intento of that perception, not the tree. Yep. And right. this is critical for understanding what intentionality means. This is why he says that there's a sense in which it is something which is in the subject. It is not simply in the subject because it's also the window by which the subject is always already outside, as he says, right? Mm -hmm. but, the in, but the intentio in that perception is not the tree. A physicist might think, well, the tree is the thing that's actually over here, over there, and he oriented on it because of you know uh, uh, some light phenomena, and uh, so obviously he wasn't oriented on the man. He obviously he was oriented on the tree. The tree is the only thing actually there. There isn't any man there. How can he be oriented on it? But this is completely misunderstand the phenomena of intentionality. Yeah, intentionality. It, 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 hang on, let me finish. So there's a lot of people who haven't done the Husserl, so I want to lay it down. Intentionality is something like you're allowed to lay down the meanings you give to the logical counters you use in thinking about the world. It's like you're allowed to name things. You're allowed to put down uh, a, a intended meaning for a logical element in any of, your, any of the propositions you're using in your internal thinking. And if that thing over there, you're perceiving as and projecting as and trying to orient it as the man who's walking down the street towards me, then that is the meaning that that item has in your thoughts about it until you learn otherwise and you change it, right? Your intention is toward that man, even if there's no man there. So that's what we mean by intentionality is that it's this pointer-like character of the internal thoughts oriented on something, which is pointing towards not just an external reality, but is intending to point to an, a specific internal reality that it already had a preliminary meaning even a, even a mistaken one, projected onto. And there, there, there are a couple of claims in that. First of all, it's, it's the subjective side of it, not the objective side of it, which controls what the intended thing is. But the second is that it is always already intending to be about the extent. You're not trying to think about your perceptions. You're not trying to think about your impressions. You're trying to think about the world. And precisely because you're allowed to put down what it is you're trying to think about, right? And you're putting down the world, your intentions are about the world. They're not about your thoughts. They're not about your sense impressions. Okay. Pause to see this basic level of what intentionality means is comprehensible to people or just too alien. No, that makes sense to me a great deal because um, uh, as I try to pursue uh, epistemological issues inside economics, I discovered that the main problem with what most people understand as being economics is, is what I call the third party observer fallacy. Uh, and, and economic historians uh, uh, perform the task of bringing together all the data that represents third party observers uh, and so forth, but nowhere do they get close to what's really driving uh, shifts in demand or shifts in supply because that's being made by subjective 
value judgments by behavior, behavior in a market. It has nothing to do with economic history until after it happens already. And so it's a third party fallacy there most, much of the time. But I appreciate this first party, but uh, first um, one side, you know, the original side of the acting docile, not just uh, what the guy who thinks these guys yes. must be a fool because that's not a good man, it's a tree. <laughs> right. So, so, uh, and this, this deals with the issue of the overly objective understanding of what intentionality is. We still have to deal with the overly subjective one, right? This is, he gets this on like page uh, 62 and on. Um, that's why he gave the example of the walking around the university building, right? It, it, it's not simply uh, all inside. Uh, where is it? Uh, yeah, okay, this is actually on page 66. Um, yeah, the cognitive faculty is not the terminal member of the relation between an external thing and the internal subject. Rather, its essence is the relating itself, and indeed in such a way that the intentional Dasein which thus relates itself as existence is always already immediately dwelling among things. For the Dasein, there is no outside, for which reason is also observed to talk about an inside. The claim is that because the, uh, the intentional objects of the comportments of Dasein are always the extent, they are tr true things truly in being and actual, right? The, uh, it doesn't make sense to think of the subject as being locked up inside its head and only having, you know, uh, uh, sensational uh, inputs, right? It is always already embedded in the world. And this is a claim which is not just about um, uh, the mind thought of as an extant perceiving thing. It's about the, the Dasein's ontological constitution. It's not just that the human being is equipped with this. It's more like the, the, the fact that it is possible and the why it is equipped for this. I'm gonna finish up just a thought, Joe. So, so um, a, a, a modern scientific uh, concept, cognitive science person might say, oh, but uh, that's because you have, uh, you know, the, the eyes bring in impressions of this or the other. And the question is, why do you have eyes? Why does any living being have eyes? What the hell are eyes for, right? There is an always already embodied in the extent aspect to any being with the kind of being of the Dasein or anything even beginning to approach it that always already has the, the, uh, the reasons and motivation and uh, embedded structure and whatever else you wanna call it to be oriented toward the real, to be oriented toward the actual to be oriented toward the true. You don't have senses that are designed to perceive uh, your fantasy space. You don't, you, you aren't born in virtual reality, right? There's that, there's that joke going around where you have the, 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 the big Oculus-like glasses with like empty holes in them, right? It says, you know, the newest, the latest thing, actual reality, right? That's the one you live in. Okay, uh, a, an evolutionary psychologist will say, and you're adapted to, right? But that's not the point he's making here. He's making a point here that the, the DAS sign is always already actually in the world. So uh, Kant goes on at length about the conditions of the possibility of experience and things like the intuitions of the forms of space and time and so forth, as you know, and, and th those are what he thinks of as sort of necessary structures the mind projects onto the world. Um, Heidegger is being this, doing the same thing in a much more radical way and in a much more including all of the practical, not just the theoretical way. There's no such thing as a disembodied mind. Minds are embodied. They are in the world and oriented in the world or they're not minds. Okay, so that's the, that's the phenomenological moves here. Go, go ahead, Joe. Okay. Um... I appreciate that, especially your illustration that you know your your vision uh, is already embodied in the, in the the design because it has to look out and see the world. 
uh, <clears throat> I was thinking uh, when you first started before the vision example, which makes it very much part of almost like the corpus of the dot sign, because uh, I'm not assuming that the dot sign actually, well, we assume it is a corpus, but I'm thinking maybe a slightly larger perimeter than just, you know, the built in eyes. Because many, many of the things that make our life possible are man made extensions. Absolutely. Our eyes and so forth. And so, does the design sign include all of his uh, ready at hand perceptual? Yes. Aids I mean, and, and this, this is the stuff that you won't get so much in this book, but you do get in being in time, which is the idea that um, dot sign is always in a world that includes a whole equipmental contexture that he interacts with technologically in a practical way before he interacts with it theoretically and all that kind of stuff that you get in the, yeah. the being in time side of things. And, and uh, Kant had already made the point that um, uh, even for Kant, right, the, the empirical extends to whatever the, uh, whatever tools magnify the senses to do, right? The thing you see through the microscope, the thing you see through the telescope, right? Those count as, 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 as perceptions. Right, uh, the things that you only infer from a change in a pattern on an oscilloscope, right, still counts as empirical and all that kind of stuff, right? So, um, yes, uh, the 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 underlying philosophical point that uh, Heidegger is trying to get at here is to get away from the notion that um, uh, intentionality or or the sense of meaning or being of things is only something happening inside the head. It's not. Right, there is an element of intentionality which is, um, if you want to put it this way, projected, right, um, and even legislating the the things that it is trying to attach to in the projection. But these are also always um, the organic organic functions of an embodied being, right? Um, and the contrast is, dot sign and tables are not alike in this at all. Tables do not make logical prescriptions of the things they are trying to relate to outside of themselves. Tables just are extent, right? So tables are not oriented upon the truth the way Dasein is oriented upon the truth or living in the truth. Okay, and that that truth that they're living in is always something like an uncoveredness of things. That's where we get toward the end of the of the chapter. So the. Um, Intentionality and understanding of being, uncoveredness of beings and closeness of being. This is 67 on, right? He's trying to get at and understand. All this is trying to take the direction that Kant was trying to point to when he just said, it's something like perception over here, right? He's trying to take that and run with it and say, <laughs> it's not really perception. It's something like the, uh, the being that Dasein is always already in. And this positing business is, is a way too intellectualist, interior, abstract, and propositional version of Dasein always exists already in the truth, right? And the claim is that the latter formulation is the more empirical brass tacks version of this, you know, entirely theorized uh, Kantian absolute position and pointing towards uh, perception. Okay, questions? Uh, in, so do you think when Kant is talking about this absolute position is kind of, this is related to, with uh, things in themselves, what he kind of, do they live like there together or? Um, uh, he, he does say you're positing the thing uh, uh, in itself or for itself, but he also says things in themselves cannot be known, right? So uh, there's this, uh, curious thing in Kant, that he thinks we're propositional creatures who make propositional statements about what, uh, uh, what is, and the whole set of the propositional statements is sort of the reality. But he also says that we only know our images of things or our perceptions of things or our conceptual reductions of things, and we don't know the things in themselves. So um, uh, to some degree, this is sort of Kant's uh, concession to skepticism and Hume. What Kant is really trying to say is something like, we have to think this way, but we don't really know if the way that we have to think and the way that things are have to go inside or how much they have to go inside. But he is claiming that when you do this um, uh, judging of empirical, you are putting things in absolute position. You're not just trying to claim this is how it looks to me. You're trying to claim this is the truth, but you don't really know if it's the truth. 
something like that. I, I consider a fair amount of that stuff in Kant to be kind of um, trying to immunize his position against skeptical uh, Humean uh, uh, counterarguments. But from his own understanding, he thinks that you know, the critical understanding of reason is the, it's the only rational one, so to speak. He thinks that, that something which isn't, hasn't gone through the skeptical fire, right, is just gonna be dogmatism. Um, and uh, so th there is a skeptical note in Kant, if I can put it that way, th that you don't really find in Heidegger. Um, and I think it's, you know, partly because of the, the Hume angle. So uh, it's, it's a fair question. So uh, is, is the absolute position uh, the thing in itself? Not really. It's more like, uh, because it's really more like uh, sets of things known, but there's a slipperiness in Kant, but without the sum of all the things known, which are true, right? And the reality coincide, or real, or, or uh, not reality, uh, the universe say, or, or when the universe is bigger than that, than 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 all the all the knowns. Does that help? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, and so, just to clarify on the intentionality, uh, it, it sounds like in phenomenology, it's almost a synonym for meaningfulness. So I'm walking along the path at night and I see something ahead. I think it's a person, the uh, Brentano Husserl thing is, you intended to be a person. That's the intentionality. Uh, but another way to say is I make sense of it as a person and then I get closer and then I make sense of it as a tree. So it sounds like intentionality is a synonym for making sense of the phenomenon. So in, in, in Husserl, it's prior to the making sense part. You're, you're right that, that he, he does link the two, but for him, the intentional part is a step before the, the making sense of it. The making sense of it has to be an integration of it with a whole bunch of other things. He's you know always going on about how they the thing is always way more than your perceptions of it. Um, it's got all kinds of, um, uh, if I put it this way, uh, possibility space-like extensions. You think your, your intention includes how it would look if you walked around it and, and, and so on. Um, but but uh, in terms of the, the, the meaning of it, yes, meanings are read off from the intended thing, you, but uh, to Husserl at least, that's downstream of the intention. But so, but uh, so Heidegger would go along and say, yeah, anything you make sense of, you make sense of in a world or yes. in a referential totality. So it makes sense that I'd meet somebody on the path, or yes. it makes sense that there would be a tree in front of uh, me. Uh, but you're saying for Husserl, that intentionality comes before. Yes, I mean, compared to Heidegger, Husserl is much more on the theoretical and much less on the practical and equipmental context or sort of functional uh, environment. Um, and, and he's going to put the, um, he's gonna put the logical descriptions first. They're used to organize the perceptions. Then the organized perceptions, you know, become something like the full thing from which meanings are, are read off and that are used in intentions. But all that for Husserl is very much on this um, theory and representation plane. And the move that you see in Heidegger after Husserl is to say, no, the practical is uh, and, and equipmental and even the mood uh, uh, relation of all those things to the possibilities of the Dasein's existence itself are way more fundamental than, uh, than the mere representational uh, uh, organizing of experience. That's the particularly new thing in Heidegger is that he both the move to the practical and the inclusion of all these, you know, uh, if I can put it this way, tonal aspects of the life world, right? All of the all of the aspects of uh, mood and so forth, um, which Husserl had not brought in at all. Um, uh, so in, in that sense, uh, the the perception of the man uh, on the path maybe because uh, trees are not dangerous on the path and men sometimes are and the anxiety about it is why it appears as a man, right? That's something that would never mm -hmm. occur to Husserl, but would instantly occur to Heidegger, is to you know relate the perception, what, 
what ascription was given to the to, to, to the perceived because it was projected onto the plane of the Dasein's possibilities, you know, through the lens of anxiety, right? That's, you know, a thought you would get in Heidegger that would never occur to Husserl. He would only think it looked like a man if, uh, you know, uh, he didn't notice that it only had one leg, right? <laughs> so, um, Craig, do you have a question? Yeah, one of the things that came up when I was reading this, um, I had read another article, I think it was Giles that wrote it, on the word recognition. And the question that came up is, where does the recognition fit in between the intentionality um, sort of spectrum or among that, that intentionality spectrum? At what point is recognition important that, he, that you've reconnected or recognized it as the tree, not the man? Right. Well, when you're when you're when you're learning that a previous uh, uh, a previous intended perception was wrong, right? Uh, that might be an, uh, a moment of recognition. You can also have a moment of recognition if you just see that two ascriptions coincided, right? You know, the point we realize that uh, the morning star and the evening star are both Venus or something, right? It can be a moment of recognition, even if it's not a a previous an error about a previous, but a connecting of, pre of two previous. But for, for Husserl, the, the changes in those descriptions are much less important to him than the, uh, how to put it, uh, the, the fact that they are um, basic to how thought works before any exterior objective or logical criticism of them, right? You, you don't need an epistemologist to sign off on your descriptions of meanings to things. You don't need an objective reality to, uh, verify that they were uh, correct or correct enough for those uh, connections to have been made. The connections are made first and anything about their truth or falsity by empirical critique or by objective critique or by third party critique later is uh, not only secondary, it's gonna be done exactly the same way, right? Um, it's only gonna work if, if, uh, if you, if, if you if there's a sense-making putting together afterwards, right, with the same intentional uh, orientations um, that replaces the previous. So I don't think recognition is a fundamental term for them. I mean, representation certainly is a fundamental term in, in Husserl. Um, and for him, representation has to do with this, um, uh, a thought-like impossibility space, you know, recreation of something which was originally uh, experienceable or something like that. And for, but for him, that's just trying to show that the mind is independent of the stream of sense perception. That's the difference between representation and presentation. Um, uh, representation is also used uh, significantly in Heidegger, but more often to differentiate his own view from what he sees as an overemphasis on the representations as the or things that uh, uh, the human being orients itself on. He doesn't think that it is. He thinks that there, there's all kinds of things which are not that mental, so to speak, that are part of the um, practical orientation of the of the consciousness. Um, I don't know if that helps, but another way yeah, to think helps. about this, yeah, way to think, yeah. great. Another way to think about this in terms of the Husserl Heidegger different differences for 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 Husserl. Um, what corresponds to absolute position is um, consciousness. Husserl says that uh, um, absolute consciousness is absolutely posited uh, in all acts of the mind. He has something like a notion of absolute position as Kant has, but the thing that he puts in absolute position, Husserl does, is consciousness. He's trying to say something like, you cannot imagine the non-existence of your own consciousness. Not really. May think about it, but all the thinking about it is happening in your imaginary consciousness, right? Um, and a bunch of the always alreadys that you get in Heidegger, right, have a precursor in this notion of uh, the necessary existence of consciousness in Husserl. Um, so I, I, I just don't know if that helps bring out the contrast between him and Heidegger on that point. Um, so I want to. Uh, I've I've gotten through a bunch of the a bunch of the things here, but the we got to get to the very end of the chapter for a second because what does he think that he's shown? He thinks that he's shown that um, 
Kant's thesis was insufficient, that we can get a better understanding of the direction of perception that he was talking about if we think of the Dasein as oriented toward the, uh, the truth and the uncoveredness of the truth uh, uh, and to trying to understand the extent and always already living with the extent, that that's the sense of absolute position, that that's the sense of the empirical. What's really going on here is that something like the, the Dasein consciously or not always already knows that it's in a world uh, of things that matter, uh, that, are, that it is oriented on. And it's not simply that they're outside of itself, it's that it is always already out among them and within them. So there are no disembodied consciousnesses. There's no need to uh, learn how the mind steps outside of itself into the world because it's always already there. Um, these sort of moves on the previous subject object questions, all of those have been made. But the other claim has been that uh, something like uncoveredness of, of being has, uh, is, is happening in that, what Kant would call an empirical direction right? And it's happening as the thing that Dasein is always oriented on well before you get to any, you know, modal category on a, uh, on a, on a particular judgment of a particular theoretical proposition, right? If, if Kant thinks of us as being uh, logical proposition judgmenters upon, right? Uh, Heidegger saying, no, all that's way later. First, you're always already in the world and understanding something like being as the meaningful around you and oriented on and uncovering it, right? The uh, being in time formulation of that is Dasein is the being that is open to being. Um, okay, so we've gotten a bunch of these positive things about his own existential view besides the criticisms of Kant. Um, and he's about to turn to um, what's the difference between the being of things and the essence of things. So the essence, what is the difference between essence and existence in actual or existent things? Um, as a, uh, he wants to, he, he says that we have to make reality itself an ontological problem because in, in Kant, if something was not an existence thing, if something was just a just an essence thing, if it was just a uh, a determinate a, a, a determinatio, it was something which determines a being. It was treated as being sort of logically unproblematic, right? Our essence is uh, ontologically or logically un unproblematic. How do we get access to essences? We learned that we oriented on beings, but how do we get access to essences? So that that's something that's going to be coming up in the next chapter. I'm just foreshadowing what to keep track of as we go to the next, but I've covered the, the, the core things I wanted to make sure I covered in the, in, in, in the, in the chapter, but there's, there's tons more. Uh, but I wanna give you guys a chance to ask questions about the things which you didn't understand along the way that I might not have clarified, um, uh, et cetera. If, if the floor is open and no one talks, I'm going to call on people. <laughs> so check, is, is any of this much less, uh, you talked about how incomprehensible it was uh, after you got you know, a short way into the chapter, uh, the chapter itself. Is it equally incomprehensible now or is it more comprehensible or can you- No, it's much more comprehensible. Um, I have three pages in a small notebook of questions and thoughts to think about. <clears throat> And I will indeed uh, send you um, with some trepidation, uh, one or two things to ask about, because I don't want to take too much of your time. I mean, you're a busy and a professional person, but um, yes, it makes more sense. Uh, I have a better under, um, impression about how Heidegger is in his presentation uh, quarreling with Kant. Um, but there's so many um, um, possible misunderstandings that I still have that I 
I want to think about this before I send you something. I'll, I'll try and send I understand. you something. In the I understand. Too. And, and, and if you want to send questions by email, you know, just to me, uh, sort of sharing them next time, that's just fine. I, I'm always, always open to that. Um, don't worry about my time, especially, I mean, I've got like four days of work this week and then I'm off for a week and a half. So um, uh, I oh. don't have time, right? It's, well, that's vac good. Vacation's coming up, right? So All I right. have other things planned, but I, 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 I'm not going to lack for time between now and the next one. Let's put it that way. That's um, very good. I will I will send uh, maybe three questions first and then three questions next. Okay. Sure. Okay. Uh, can, can I can I ask this? I mean, I've been following sure. mostly for the last hour. Uh, I wanted to hear like what what is the what is the brief answer to whether existence is a predicate or not? He Heidegger's answer. He Heidegger's answer is he he agrees with Kant that existence is not a real predicate in the following sense. Being is not a, itself a being. So he, he thinks that that's the true aspect of what uh, Kant focused on, right? Um, he, he, he's not disagreeing with that thesis of Kant. He's, the places where he's disagreeing with Kant is, he, is on the positive aspect where he said that being is absolute position and, uh, sorry, a being is position and, and uh, a judgment of existence is absolute position. He thinks that that's not uh, clear. He thinks it's not coherent. He thinks that it's pointing in the right direction to something like uh, empirical actuality, but that the reason that Kant is unclear on the point is Kant hasn't grounded how something like empirical actuality is a phenomena for uh, human existence radically enough. He didn't start from why there is something like empirical existence for for human consciousness and he should have right he's trying to explain the conditions of the possibility of experience and one of the conditions of the possibility of experience from Heidegger's point of view is the human being is always already in the world and you don't find propositions like that in Kant and he thinks that you have to go down to that level and that's not just with propositions like that and a whole chain of propositions like that in order to be able to understand why judgments for existence are about something like an empirical not a theoretical actuality well there you go <laughs> you don't find propositions like that in Kant. as hard as i try to put them there okay okay i like that yes yes uh uh and and the other thing he'll get to by the time he's ended he hasn't gotten there yet but uh, if you want to understand the difference between something like actuality and something like reality, uh, sooner or later, you're going to have to talk about time because the actual is what transpires in time. And there, the, the fact that human existence is always already oriented upon time, that is what he calls temporality. The human existence is temporal existence. We're not, not only not disembodied minds, we are not outside of time in eternity logic machines either, right? We are always already in time. So the, the possibility of experiencing the actual as opposed to the real is there because we are in time beings, not eternal logic machines. Yeah, that, that, that is interesting actually, because yeah, when I come to think of it, we only ever talk about time in the uh, Kant group when we sort of discuss, you know, the idea of other possible rational beings besides humans. And then so there's sort of an evolutionary angle, or we talk about <clears throat> like, you know, the process of judgment, critique of judgment is my favorite one of the three, I think. <clears throat> and, the, other, uh, the other place where you do get time arrived. in Kant, the other place we do get time in Kant is just the, 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 um, the categories of the understanding of everything being, you know, positioned in space and everything being positioned in time and some of those but things. There, but there, but there's only there's only uh, as you were saying, uh, propositions. They're, they're they're just statements. It's it's all it's yes. all day. Yes, and the internal sense of time is just used to date befores and afters in Kant, right? The the first guy who really gets the um, focuses on the internal sense of time consciousness. You get a little bit of that in Dilthey, and you get tons of it in Husserl. Bergson. And, Bergson, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, Disley, Bergson, Husserl, and then obviously uh, Heidegger making it, you know, critical to Dasein. Um, but 
there was a, only a precursor of that in the in, in recognizing time as one of the categories of the necessary categories of the understanding in in Kant, um, and way too superficially, it, it seems to me. Um, but fine question about what does he come down on the on the on the Kant's thesis? He, he basically agrees with it, but only with a proviso. The reason that it's not a real predicate is that being is not a being. But what being actually is, he doesn't think Kant has told us. That's that's why I mean, I, I, like uh, Aaron said it pretty nicely that uh, Kant is the least metaphysical of the uh, of the big philosophers, and that that's actually why she likes him. So maybe that was you know him not giving priority to the question of what is being was something that she liked, and I think I share that still. But but I'm interested to see where it goes. Yeah, I think that I think Arendt has some of shares some of this uh, time consciousness business that she got from Heidegger, honestly. Um, uh, way more than you get from Kant. Um, I think that she's more indebted in her sense of history, for example, or, or action in history, way more indebted to Heidegger than to, than to Kant. Um, but that's just an aside about Arendt. Um, Joe, I think we answered a bunch of your questions, but are there other questions that things confused you along the way we should cover? Uh, no, I've been following along pretty well and uh, looking forward to launching into chapter two. Uh, and uh, in terms of your original statement that we might do this over five sessions, that guess I guess we go to chapter three by itself, 50 pages uh, next time instead of going the full 75 or so we did this time. That, that would be the idea. The idea would be we would just do... Um... Next time, we just do chapter two. Um, this is the thesis of medieval ontology. Um, so that takes us only to page uh, 121. Um, so as you say, like 50 pages or less. And I think that's just fine. It's, it's, it's uh, better to have something like that. Um, in terms of time, um, I do want to solicit people's um, abilities, or sorry, uh, uh, what I mean abilities, I mean um, uh, availabilities. Um, I would uh, aim for, Sunday the 9th, that's uh, three weeks from now. Um, if people tell me that because of things of a break, they needed to postpone another week, I could I could live with that, but I would prefer to do the uh, January 9th. Does that work for people? Works for me. Okay. Is it the following yeah. weekend is, is the uh, M -M MLK day or whatever? Hmm. You should probably try to avoid that three day weekend. Fair point. Uh, I mean, I often like using three-day weekends for things like this, but that's that's fine. Uh, the, the ninth works for me, and I think it might be better than the sixteenth for reason given. Anyone else have a problem with the ninth? Okay. So for next time, chapter two, um, the system of medieval ontology, the constitution of being, of being there belong essence and existence, and uh, same time on the ninth. Uh, if people have questions, uh, as, as you mentioned, sending to e me an email or things on the group are okay. I will, um, uh, this has been recording, and when I'm done recording, I will uh, post this on YouTube and put the link in the description below. So if you want to review any of the sec sections, you can. Um, but other people, uh, any other people have uh, questions on, on chapter one? Yeah. Yeah. Uh... This, this whole business with uh, that Descartes started with, with that kind of substance is not, what's the, are they overlap exactly with the, what, what was understood as existence? Like? So it's a fine question. Uh, we haven't gotten into it yet. It's going to be a subject of chapter three, the thesis of modern ontology, that to, there are two fundamental kinds of being, the, the, the thinking being and the uh, uh, res, res cogitans and res extensia, right? So that's the place where that's really going to be the problematic. Um, uh, but hold that question for chapter three is my, is my, is my first, my first, uh, suggestion for, I think from Heidegger's point of view, he doesn't think that his notion of existence exactly coincides with the Cartesian notion of res cogitans, uh, nor does he think his notion of extent exactly corresponds with the Cartesian notion of res extensia, just to foreshadow. Um, but, uh, he does think that that distinction was trying to get at something like that. Uh, difference in being between the uh, the existent and the extant. Um, but uh, uh, from Heidegger's point of view, there's a tendency in the whole tradition, including in Descartes, to try to understand 
thought and things that think too much from the standpoint of external existence. Uh, existence, I mean, so it, it's in the sense of extant. Um, so that's just a, a, a preview of, of how that problem might come out. Um, but that's exactly what chapter three is about. Okay, thank you. Yep, good question. Just, just, just to say passing, it occurs to me. So yeah, extant, that actually uh, concurs with the modern usage of the word, such as a species is, is extant, right? Yes. As extinct. Yeah. Yes. Although the thing that was being translated that way by our translator, I think in the German is often uh, uh, being at hand in Heidegger, um, for, for hand insight, for hand insight. Uh, Pete, I wanted to give you a question, uh, a, a chance. I think you had good questions along the way, but do you have things that you thought I left out in the reading that you wanted to cover or wanted to think should have been covered? You're on, you're on mute, Pete. Yeah, so the, nothing that you left out, but one thing that uh, confused me a bit is uh, at a certain point towards the end of chapter one, he says, you know, we've been following Kant on his predicate thing, and finally we come to the ontological difference. Mm -hmm. uh, but then he doesn't, it, it seems like we've come to the ontological difference and this is the end of Kant for us because Kant is not aware of the ontological difference because he never addresses the ontological difference and Kant directly. So I'm taking Correct. it in the sense of he, he uh, Kant passed over the ontological difference. He does think that Kant passed over the ontological difference. I think he's mostly foreshadowing here, right? I mean, he's he's going to be, this is going to be one of the things that he uses to unify things in the four chapters as a problem that they all touch upon but didn't solve. And when he gets to his own section, he's going to try to make the ontological difference more the center uh, of, the, of the discussion. The place where he brings it up here is just the difference between the, when something is uncovered, right, to, for Dasein, right, there's the uncoveredness of the uncovered thing, right? And there's the thing that is uncovered. Um, the uncoveredness is something like the fact that it appears or isn't the truth or is the Dasein in some sense. But the thing which is uncovered is something like the being of that being. And the being of that being is not simply that being. So he, it, it may be a strained uh, 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 finding of the topic, but he's trying to show that when he, he was following up this lead of look towards the empirical, and in doing so, he came to his own, you know, um, uh, being in the truth, uncoveredness of the extent uh, uh, aspect of things. And in that, in, in, in that, he found not from Kant, but from himself, right, uh, uh, an ontological difference thing. He wasn't saying that Kant was talking about that. He's saying he noticed it in, the, in where the problem led him. And he just sort of leaves that there as a marker, right? Ontological difference here, right? And if he leaves that marker in four different places, then comes back to it, he'll be able to tie them together. So all he's done here is lay down that marker that ontological difference, ontological difference problematic comes up here somewhere and he'll sprinkle those and then he'll try to tie them together at the end. Now, will he get far enough at the end to have tied them fully together? Well, he'll have a chapter five will be about it, but you'll have to judge whether or not he got far enough because he only got to about one fourth of what he intended to do in part three before the lecture of course ended. Um, but uh, you're right to note that he sort of just laid that down as like a hint um, and doesn't seem to be, you know, too fully fleshed out yet. Um, is Kant aware of that di difference? I mean, K Kant doesn't think of that difference the way that uh, Heidegger does. So in that sense, I would say no. Um, when, when Kant thinks of ontology, he thinks of it much the way that um, Christian Wolff did before him. He thinks of it as this top level of metaphysics that considers what's true of all beings as opposed to what's true of different categories of being like nature or um, uh, you know, uh, metaphysics or life, soul, whatever, which are like the different critiques uh, or the different forms of uh, understanding. But 
the ontology layer for Kant is just the, the, the layer of what is proved of beings as such on top of that. And he doesn't think of that as ontology as opposed to the ontic in the Heideggerian way. He just thinks of it in the category of generality, right? How, how general across different um, types of being is it? And Kant's only real way of thinking about the most general there is it's like the sort of logically most general. And in that he's basically following Wolf. Um, if you've got something which is true of you know, all propositions as such, then it's gonna be at the ontological level. If it's about propositions about nature, then it's not gonna be at the ontological level anymore because it's gonna be part of the philosophy of nature. Um, so in that sense, I think that uh, Heidegger doesn't think that Kant understands the ontological difference as he, Heidegger understands it. And it is true that what Kant thinks of as the ontological layer is a different layer and a different direction of distinction. Um, when uh, Heidegger talks about the ontological difference, he means the difference between being and uh, the beings or the be even the being of the beings. But the but being itself is something which is uh, distinct from the, uh, the beings. Um, the only thing that Kant yeah. said on, on that subject was that being was something like position and that's not an ontological difference. Right. So, so tell me if this is too naive, but in terms of Wolf and Kant saying that being is a predicate would mean that there's things out in the world and they have properties. And Wolf is saying one of those properties is it exists or not. And Kant is saying, no, that's not a property of things, whether they exist or not. That's not a real predicate. Correct. That's correct. I mean, and the particular way that Wolf put it was he, he wanted to tell you, if you want to know what, uh, what being is, it's whatever that thing is that the actual thing has that the possible thing just like it doesn't have. So he called it complement of possibility, right? And he was relying on you previously having an intuitive understanding of the difference between an actual thing and a possible thing in order to say that. But he did consider that as a predicate, as something which could be true or false of a thing, so that all the things which are actual have a yes in the check mark for being, prop uh, be being uh, property, and all the things which are merely possible but not actual have a no in, in, the, in, in the slot for you know, being property. And this thinking of all of the things as being categorizable by where they have the yeses and where they have the noes with respect to each possible property, that comes straight from Descartes. That's Descartes to Leibniz to Wolf on a straight line. Um, does that help? Yeah, and so Kant says, no, that's not what's going on. That's, that's not, not what's, what's going on. That, that is what that is what's going on with roundness and squareness and 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 orangeness, but it's not what's going on with being. Yes, and his way of explaining that is that the um, all the all of the things about um, orangeness and so forth are questions are are things which you ask about are all things like this are some things like this is this thing like this, but in the in the when you're asking a, a being question you're asking instead the modal question, is it possible? Is it necessary? Is it actual without being necessary? And because that modal question is what you're getting at in existence questions, it's nothing like the other ones, which are all about, is it some, all, or one? Yeah, but again, the, 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 the frame in which Kant is thinking about it is the logical possibility frame not even the logical possibility, it's the propositional frame. He's thinking about it in terms of categories of propositions and what they answer. Um, and in Descartes or Wolf, right, it's just, can you predicate it of it? Anything you can predicate it of a subject is a predicate of the subject. And if you could say the mountain is, then you're predicating is of the mountain. Just naively reading it off from the nature of the sentence. Right. Yep, fine question. All right, uh, Sam, any questions? Give you a chance here, you wanna jump in? 
No, no, just, uh, yeah, I'm just like, you know, trying to decide like yeah, how much lingo I'll have to learn and immerse myself into if I were to ever <laughs> take a head of your... Yeah, get a sense of how hard or easy it is. That's fair. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm always interested in uh, how hard or easy it seems after these and if it makes it seem easier, um, just to know whether or not it's helping. Um, but uh, you know, in the end, you got to make your own uh, your own call about what's uh, how deep you want to dive in these things. Yeah, I think because I have an interest in kind of, I'll be motivated to read that chapter after the fact, and that may that may be the way I go through the whole book. Actually, <laughs> to have you give us the uh... yeah, that's fine, uh, and and you know, that's one of the reasons I put up the uh, uh, put up the videos as well. If people want to review those uh, and go back and read afterwards, it's it's just fine. All right, uh, I think I'm gonna um, sh shut down the recording and uh, uh, wish you all uh, uh, pleasant holidays and uh, uh, see you guys back on the 9th. See you. Bye-bye.